Science, all that good stuff. Oh, let me let me let me reintroduce you because I guess my sound was off. I apologize. So let me start from the beginning again. Let me go back five seconds because again, audio issues are a thing. Uh, I apologize. So, anyways, I was saying that I happen to like that song that uh, I had put for this particular uh, show. It was actually a show a song that was actually written for the Non Sequitur Show by Danny. Uh, Sorrel, he is a friend of mine that sings for a group called the Paradox Twin, and I, I just can't get enough of that song. But anyways, let me reintroduce my guest again. Uh, he, he may have to fix his camera because I have it chopped off his head the way uh, it was. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but anyways, look, I, I will introduce him again to stroke his ego. The wonderful, the magnificent, the brilliant, the super intelligent, the like, two-time world's mathematical champion for Mercene Primes, the magnificent and in Kurt Noel. Oh, thank you kindly, and good morning, <laughs> good afternoon. Or good evening, depending on time zone and latitude from your friendly universal secular astronomer. And we are going to today talk about uh, knowledge and belief and science and so forth. Although, um, Steve, did you stay up or get up early to watch the, uh, uh, the briefing about the imaging of the black hole in the center of our I galaxy? I literally set my alarm for 5.45 local time. Um, I watched it in time, and I was probably one of the first people to, as soon as I showed that black hole, uh, Sagittarius A star, yep. I, I took a screenshot of it, and I put it on my Twitter. Um, I had to be one of the first, because I was like, boom, I had all ready to go. I, <laughs> all I did was a screenshot, upload it, boom. So um, if you go to my Twitter, I have that uh, screenshot. Yeah, I actually wanted to, to get up early, because I think that was a historic moment. I do think that yes, was it does. something that was adding to uh, our, our, the topic that we're discussing on scientific knowledge. This added to this. This 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 you know, codified our, our radio transmissions from the center of the galaxy and said, oh, look, there is something there. And does, does it match predictions? Does it match scientific theories? Absolutely. Um, and they used, you know, other forms of knowledge from math, mathematics and computer programming to, to get this image. Now, it isn't an optical image as we would think of an optical picture, but it is predicated on, on radio rays telemetry. And so to me, it is a photograph. It is, it's a photograph. It happens to be, you know, enhanced in a few ways because of computer simulations. But it is, you know, generally based upon the data that we got from the, the uh, center of the uh, galaxy. So, yeah, I definitely got up for that because I think it was just a huge, huge leap forward uh, for our scientific understanding of, of black holes in astrophysics. It's another confirmation of something which we, we knew originally. But this is, again, confirming models, right? Yes. And, and so there is a case, you know, and, and a thing that that people should realize is that 
Um, the image you saw, which is, again, sort of a glowy thing around a, a, a dark spot, um, where the dark spot represents the shadow of the black hole, and this glowing around it are the accretion disk material falling into the black hole, um, that object is, is a much smaller angular uh, size than the one that did in M87. You might have seen the M87 system. Um, M87's black central black hole is one of the largest black holes we know of. And and our um, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is about three orders of magnitude smaller, even though it's closer. And and so you're talking about something where that that accretion disk around M eighty seven's image would have stretched beyond the, the the size of our solar system, whereas the ring and the glowing ring you saw in that image on Sagittarius A star, the center of our galaxy, is a would fit inside the orbit of Mercury. So it's a much smaller object. And so they had to do a lot more uh, work to get that smaller detail. The other thing is that that object is moving. Um, it, things, are, things are in motion. And, and the, the challenge, the old challenge in the M87 was, because M87 is very, very, very slowly evolving. You can, you can have different telescopes at different times taking images of the same thing and buzz together. But um, it, with the Sagittarius A star, they had to get they had to do a montage of of things and adjust for time, which made it which made it extraordinarily difficult. Um, and then they made use of simulations where they said, OK, um, we have this data. We have this observation. Again, we're talking about science and a scientific method. We have this observation. What does this data mean? And so they went through simulation to say, well, we can set up mathematical model of a whole bunch of different conditions and um, conditions in terms of, of mass and spin of the black hole and charge and other other parameters and and varying the conditions to try to find a simulation that that matched. And they have found um, um, a couple of simulations in a, in, a, in a regime that they expect it to be, that is not some of the really wacky extreme simulations, but some of the simulations that, that were more plausible happen to also very well match stuff. So you have an image up here on the, on the screen? Yeah, I put this, a side-by-side -side comparison. This is from the um, uh, seminar that they had today. They compared the Sagittarius A star to the M87. Uh, similarities and differences. Uh, and, and as you had mentioned, you know, we're talking about an object with such a small arc second of angular resolution. So if, if pe people that are wondering what that kind of means, if you have a subtended angle from your eye and you're looking at something out, uh, imagine like the width of the moon, which I believe is like one arc second, mm -hmm. right? One width of the moon is, about, is, 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 is on the order of uh, 30 arc minutes, I believe. Is that right? Half a degree. Half a degree. Okay, so half a degree. Um, but imagine that object being much further out. And as it moves away from us, it's going to be a much smaller angular resolution. So it's basically just think about how much space it takes up in the sky, right? The sun is a very large object. It's very close again, to us. About, about half degree, yeah. Yeah, so, so the sun is about a half a degree because that's how we have eclipses, a total eclipse, right? Because they're about the same angular resolution. But the sun is a much bigger object, uh, even though it's much further away. So... You were talking about a, 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 an object that's very, very large, about the size, you know, give or take the, the, the orbit of Mercury, but it's extremely far away. And they've yeah. able to they've, they, they capture this kind of resolution is mind blowing. Again, this was one of the sharp, this yeah. was the sharpest image. They, you know, people are saying it's blurry. Yeah. It's not. This it, is actually this a very the, sharp image. This is the most detailed, sharpest external image ever, ever produced. And, and to give you the size of how big that, that again, we're talking about the, the, the object which is on the right, which is Sagittarius A star, um, that object, it, it, if you if you, you you know how big the moon is, right? And you see the moon up in the sky. Well, imagine a tennis ball sitting on the moon. That object would be slightly smaller than that tennis ball sitting on the moon. And they imaged details around that tennis ball. That's how that's how detailed this 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 image is. A tennis ball sitting on the surface of the moon is a is a little bit larger than angular diameter of that image. That and that's that's amazing. I mean, and, and not not only that. Think about how much dust there is between the center of the Milky Way and before it reaches us. I mean, think how much mm -hmm. this massive amount of of just you know um, a, 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 a opaque uh, material that is there that you cannot see through. I mean, it's it's basically yeah. dense. It's hot. It's 
it's <laughs> you're like looking through fog trying to see something yeah uh that has you know that i wouldn't say the luminosity is this is very bright would you agree no it's not yeah. and 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 as well when they looked at the luminosity they had an idea about the amount of material falling in to to the this black hole which it's is very small. You know, yeah but it, but small as in Compared, uh, it's it, it's it's compared with M87, but it's like was it 21 million solar masses is, is the current estimate, and and yet the amount of material falling in is is less than about a grain of rice uh, a year. Yeah, and that's in, in mass, like absolutely like nothing comparative. But again, we're talking about relative sizes here. You know, well, most of the space is you know a cubic meter of space. You might have an atom or two in in, in, right. in most galactic space. So uh, a grain of, of rice is, is a huge chunk, but relative to our atmosphere, it is it is pretty that, that, pretty thin. That, that's still a lot of mass going in. I mean, relatively speaking, it would, it would engulf us. <laughs> yes. Now, M87, the monster black hole, and uh, M87's central black hole actually is quite is has as, as comparatively feeding frenzy, and in fact, it has jets uh, from from the accretion disk that that. You know, was was first people suspected that there was some active nuclei because of, you know, in inside M87 because they could see these jets streaming out from the uh, thing in both radio and visible uh, wavelengths um, that 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 are characteristic of, of M87. So so again, one of the things that 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 we had we had reasonable evidence that there is there was a there was a black hole at the center of our galaxy, and some of it has to do with the fact that. We've been tracking stars orbiting. There's, there's a bunch of stars in the region that are orbiting um, the, the the central black hole, and based upon you can calculate based on oral mechanics and you know the the, the motion of those of those uh, stars, you get an estimate on the on the mass, and and given one star that actually comes relatively reasonably close to the to, to the black hole before spinning off again, that. Um, you know that put a, a physical constraint on the size of the thing because because otherwise it, it, if if it was, it was just just some giant rock thingy there, um, it, the star would hit it right. So so we knew from the star's orbit that comes closest to that center point um, it had to be smaller than than the closest passage. Um, now we actually have a, a direct image where you can see the the shadow again. The dot in the center is not the black hole. It's the shadow of light not reaching us. The glowy stuff around it is material that's in the process of falling in through the across the um, event horizon, as you say, which that we sort of treat as the edge of the black hole. And and as the material moves towards the black hole, um, it becomes twisted, warped. It's subjected to uh, uh, very strong magnetic fields and so forth, and gets heats up to a high temperature and glows. Right, so we're seeing the effect of the. It's not just the the stuff going down your drain pipe. It is stuff which is moving a reasonable fraction of the speed of light at high temperatures because it's all banging into each other and being switched and twisted and and and, and shredded. Um, by the time it gets into that glowing stage, it's plasma. The, the electrons have been stripped off of atoms. Any, any chemical bonds have been destroyed, and you have a bunch of nuclei and electrons that are going down there. And you're able to measure the temperature of the nuclei and the temperature of the electrons, which were separate because they've been disassociated and they're, they're, they're moving at slightly different speeds. So they're able to determine, yes, it has got a charge. Um, it's, it's, it, that simulations that they say suggest that it spins. Some of, the, um, some of the next data they're going to do in analysis is try to determine how fast the the spin is because there there are, there are three things that at least that escape uh, black holes. One is the gravitational field. You you affect feel the effect of the of gravitational field of the mass that makes up the black hole. Second is spin. Angular momentum is 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 still there. And third is charge, electric charge. So the, so the 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 central black hole has a charge, and and that electric field is also uh, playing havoc with with it with the, with now the plasma moving around it, causing all kinds of things to happen. So here was a case where we started with Einstein's um, equation for relativity. And if you look at those equations and said, well, based on these equations, that must mean there's something of a 
they call it a black hole, a hole in space where the world lines, the 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 the, the space time lines of, of of things going through the motions terminate. It's not a matter of it keeps going on. It's a matter of, of, of the world lines that cross that event horizon end there from our perspective. There's a point of no return. And and Einstein sort of initially sort of, and, and quite rightly so, he said, well, that's the mathematics. That's what the math says. But there's nothing that would say the universe actually does something crazy like this. Uh, does it keep... Yeah, well, the no no harem theorem was was a theorem. I mean, it's it's still yes. a theorem. It's basically that the only the three things that are residual from the original um, components that made up the black hole, whether it be yeah. a, a type one supernova or, or or merging of neutron stars, whatever com comprised yeah. the original thing of the black hole, there's only three things that remains: the charge, the spin, and the uh, the uh, mass. That's that's those are the yes. three things. Everything else is pretty much destroyed except for the information is encoded. On the event horizon, due to the holographic principle, maybe but, that's again that's a conjecture, but, and and in fact, you know, Hawking and I talked about the fact that he should have given up, whether he should have given up. Drop, I love that. Hawking and I were kicking it one day, and we were discussing the uh, holographic principle. <laughs> on, I didn't mean to talk about it. I love it, dude. I love it. I love when you do that. I just, I, um, I love uh, it. Although, although, yeah. although with Hawking, it you're you're better off having you are better off having conversations over the internet. Than sitting there in person because the conversations are take a very long time. Now, why do you, why do you think though that okay? First of all, I do I do believe that information is fundamental. I believe that is the the zeroth law when it comes to the universe. I believe that information is conserved. Um, I know you and Suskin and you and Hawking had had been involved very intricately in whether their you know information is destroyed uh, on that topic. Yeah. Um, I think Suskin was correct on it. Um, However, I mean, he did pay Hawking uh, the bet, but I mean, do, do you do you think that that is still at the point where the holographic principle is still merely a principle uh, that that the information that we think is encoded on the event horizon, which I do think applies to our observable universe? I think the universe itself is encoded in a Hubble sphere, and that we—I know this sounds odd—but we are basically a hologram, informational-wise, right? Yeah. So. So, a matter of saying, the question comes to you: Is information destroyed sure. yeah. or or conserved when it when it crosses the event horizon? And and here, this is getting different between uh, knowledge and belief. We don't know. Um, um, now, some people believe it is; some people believe it isn't. And 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 kind of the notion: if if you come if you come at it from the point of view of quantum mechanics, you believe that. The information is conserved. Um, so imagine what you mean by conserved. Well, you know, the question is, um, in quantum mechanics, if you take a book and throw it in the fire, because let's say you're one of these people that doesn't land, doesn't like truth, and so you're going to destroy this book, um, have you just have you truly destroyed the information in that book? Well, quantum mechanics says, no, it is possible, given the state of things and measurements, that you could reconstruct all the ashes and all the gases that came out of burning that book and reconstruct the book and restore the knowledge. That quantum mechanics says, no, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. It may be in a usable form, but it's well, not and that's, destroyed. That's, that's a big question. Um, if the information is encoded, and I, and I do think it's, it, it is, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessitate that it's reconstructable data. It is, it's so yes. high, the entropy is so high and it's so um, been changed to the point where it, it's still the information, but it's in a non-recombinable -re way to restore exactly when it went in there. Yeah. That's how I yeah. do it. And, and so there's a matter of saying, you say, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have sufficient evidence to show that quantum mechanics is correct in this matter. Um, and, and if you follow the lines of logic with relativity, you say, no, the information is lost. World lines go past the thing and, it, and it's gone, right? And, and, and even if the, even the black hole leaks Hawking radiation um, and evaporates. And again, we don't, we haven't, we don't have evidence that that black holes are are emitting Hawking radiation. We have a conjecture. Well, I think we have. I see. I, I just. I, I think mathematical evidence is evidence. I think when you have. Oh. I mean, I know you. This is you know just a terminological <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. Um, but I really do believe very strongly when we say we don't have evidence. It's like okay, we do have evidence, but it's in the form of theoretical evidence. It's for mathematical theory. Um, you know, uh, the fact that you know they even predicted black holes because of Einstein's equations and Einstein's field equation, yeah. which, by the way, did not necessitate they must ontologically exist. 
right? I mean, same thing with white holes. They predict white holes. We haven't discovered a white hole yet. We don't. We, yeah. we have no and, idea whether they. And and it's same thing with like wor wormholes and other things are, are are there. So so um, it's a matter of saying uh, that that um, you know uh, my advisor used to say that the universe does not ask permission to do what it does. Yeah, it doesn't so care. So you could you you can come up with all these mathematical models. Mm -hmm which mathematically are interesting and maybe be self-consistent, but that doesn't say that's what the universe does. So right. when Einstein was first cautious about saying black holes exist, what he's saying is, well, the math suggests that they might be, but we need to have evidence and that, that because, it, because it seems so implausible. It was so, so, so absurd. But there's a lot of stuff with quantum mechanics that seems absurd that has now been actually measured. Mm -hmm. So So what... What you 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 have to do, and for example, inside the black hole, um, one there there is conjectures that the material continues to 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 be crushed and comes to a singularity, a point, a mathematical point. Um, I have trouble believing that. I've always have as well. And and I don't I don't believe that there that singularities exist. Mm -hmm. They're mathematically there mm -hmm. but i think something breaks down but i don't know what it is yeah. right so so notice this thing i i use the word believe usually i try not to use the word believe because of a problem with language and binocular a lot of people are scared of belief or see it as pejorative or see it as salvation right it's something holy. yeah it's an equivocation of the uses of the term and, and and so people then will go through great contortions including bastardization of terms in order to try to avoid belief. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, I've, I've been on Facebook uh, today and, uh, you know, I, I run into these people that clearly do not know what they're talking about. And it's, it's, it's quite obvious, right? And of course, you know, they think I'm some kind of like just rando off the internet, not knowing my history on these topics. <laughs> and and I, look, and I'm not saying I'm a Rhodes Scholar, okay? I mean, I mm -hmm. have, you know, my, I have a, a you know, formal education of some degree. Uh, I don't have my degree, but I mean, I, I have well enough credits. I mean, yeah. I, I've, yeah. I've, I've well established myself as a layperson to at least have a fundamental yeah. understanding of many topics that I do talk about. And so uh, it's, it's, it's odd that, you know, when I'm just trying to explain to individuals certain things about philosophy as far as, you know, like my understanding or science as far as my understanding, I mean, I mean, I, I, look, I mean, I, I did operate nuclear power plants. I did have to learn at, physics at, at some, at, some degree, you know, you know, Steve, some level. you're very intelligent and you also have a very strong set of principles. And that combination to dangerous. some people is dangerous. Yeah, yeah no, I know it is. <laughs> I, I've, I've been there, you know, I lived that. But again, it goes to like the terminological uses of the word belief, which is, means something very specific in epistemology. It is recognized as the epistemic disposition that you hold a proposition to be true or false. Normally, yeah. when we say false, we say disbelief. So you say, I disbelieve P would mean that I believe P is false. This is this is ubiquitous. This is standard terminology. But you have atheists out there that will read something that says an atheist disbelieves, you know, God exists. And they'll take it merely to mean unbelief. That's their yes. own stipulative usage. They're taking that word disbelief and they're using yeah. it in a way that's atypical and then trying to say that's normative, and that's where I step in and go, wait, no, that's not normative. Now, you, I'm not saying you cannot use the word disbelief that way, but words convey things, right? And I say, look, I st like some people might look at this, like a younger creationist might stare at this photo in disbelief, meaning they, they cannot accept that this is actually something so massively far away that it violates their understanding of creation, uh, that they accept that the universe is only 7,000 years old, so all this is basically nonsense to them. They will stare in disbelief, but that is a different usage of the word as far as epistemologically. So this is what what, what what kind of we wanted to talk talk about as a crux of the matter for this particular show, the pejorative use of the word uh, belief. But before we get into that, um, you know, it, you mentioned, I found this to be interesting that you had mentioned world lines, right, timelines. Now, people may know that I actually grew up wanting to be an astrophysicist, but then mm -hmm. I realized math was very hard, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I was I was reading books on black hole theory and and, and fundamental particle physics, you know, in high yeah. school and even as, as early as junior high. And people go, "No, you weren't." Yeah, I, I literally was. Um, yes. not, that, not that I understood the mathematics, but I did understand the concepts. And one of the things that I, I was reading about in in like ninth grade or whatever was Penrose diagrams and yes. and space time Minkowski diagrams. And even though I didn't fully understand, you know, Hilbert space or any of that type of level of mathematics, uh, as, 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 I kind of do a little bit more now, but certainly not to you know any any recognized degree but 
I, I I love the fact that you mentioned world timelines because people have the misconception about a black hole, thinking that you can escape the black hole if, in theory, you can go faster than the speed of light. But unfortunately, no. that doesn't work. And the reason why no. it doesn't work is because there's no path to travel to go out of the black hole. There literally is no yeah. way you can go. Any direction you pick in a three-dimensional vector space, you're going to be going towards that supposed singularity, no matter what direction you go. And, and, you're, and your world line ends. The world line ends at the singularity. perspective. At, right. at that spot. Now, by the way, I should mention somebody asked, um, the glowing ring go you see around it is not Hawking radiation. It's actually the material that's falling into from the other the side. It, and a lot of it's from the yes. other side. We're seeing yeah. the back of the black hole that's been. Yeah, we're seeing sort of behind yeah. around it because because the, the light, the, the world lines that go near the black hole, but don't go into the black hole in the horizon are coming around and inside. It's, 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 it's a, it's, it's like a hole of mirrors. It's like a, a it's like a, a, a funny thing in a, in a, in a, in a, in a carnival uh, mirror, magic mirror show. Um, the, so, so what you're seeing are, is material that's been, that where they, the chemicals have been destroyed, the electrons have been ripped off the atoms, they've been smashed into each other and heated to high temperatures. The Hawking radiation predicted by our central black hole would be very, 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 very low. Um, I think like pico kelvins, right? Really, yeah, very, 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 really low. That's why it takes and, trillions of years for them to actually evaporate. Yes, and so and so, um, it's 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 it would be difficult to tell that there's additional Hawking radiation. We believe, but but again, um, so when people talk about, about about items on there, you know, I I would say in the case of uh, for example, whether information is destroyed or not, um, we don't have the the evidence from we have an, a line of argument from quantum mechanics that says it can't. Mm -hmm. A line from relativity says that it that it does it is destroyed, and we know that relativity and quantum mechanics don't play well with each other in certain regimes, such as, you know, at, at or near the event horizon of a black hole. This wonders why people are studying these sort of things because we have these two um, um, theorems that that are that have extraordinary amount of of confirmation. Yeah. Right experimental evidence in the normal regimes, mm -hmm. but we know that they don't exist. They don't, they don't play nice with each other. They don't, they, they, they contradict each other and, and quite possibly both are incorrect. You need a theory of more stuff that cooperates both. Yep. So, so the, so the, the business really about is that, that, you know, um, uh, even prior to seeing the orbits of a star around such as a star, um, there were reasonable arguments to say that black holes exist, <laughs> and and astronomers like like um, um, Cygnus X one was an object, one of the first objects where there was pretty convincing data that said it exists. And again, what are these? What are these? These images you see on the screen? They're data. They're represent mm -hmm. representation of data. They're not a photograph. This is not an optical uh, photograph, it, right? Yeah, yeah as, right. As, as something the audience had mentioned, Adam, and he's on my Facebook page, he had he mentioned, scientists choose a ring-shaped geometric source model to parameterize uh, the data in the computer program. It is not a photo of a ring-shaped object. That is correct. Yeah, it's not. this is not an optical photo. This is a, a basically an image that's produced from radial telemetry that's based upon uh, the, the frequencies that they are they're, they're getting that if you were to, to relate it in an optical way that we can visualize it like this, this is what you're looking at. Right. Yeah. And it is based upon computer simulations, because as they had noted that because they're taking this at different times, because this, this object is in flux all the time, this this uh, this object changes quite rapidly, especially compared to uh, M87, which is pretty stagnant. Overall. Yeah. So, 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 so the one right. on the one on the right changes more rapidly than the one right. on, the, on the left. So so they have these computer models to kind of fill in the misinformation and then they would eliminate models that didn't work compared to what they know. And so they were only left with a very, a very small group of potential models to yeah. kind of fill in the missing data. And that's what you're seeing. So there is, you know, yeah. there's some there's some liberties here. But yes, but you have to parameterize it. You have to be able to put it into the, you know, uh, relationship to the equations that that we, we have established do work. Right. We know that. Yes. I found equations work. I mean, they're most so, well established equations out there. So the data of, of, the, of the grid of that general shape comes from the data that has been synthesized from the radio telescope um, a, 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 a reception that, been, that have been blended together. Yes. Um, information about things like the, 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 the temperature, the charge, the spin came from models. 
And so what they did is they said, because, because again, that the image you see was the image that was that was obtained from synthesizing all the various radio telescopes, giving a very long baseline um, to give you the detail. That the, the interpretation of that data came from simulations that mm -hmm. say, well, we simulate this kind of environment, this kind of environment, and try to understand what, what it is. Now, for example, when you when you took the uh, known mass of the object, because we can tell the mass by its effect on the stars orbiting it, um, and you and you take Einstein's uh, field equations and say how big would the event horizon be? That event horizon is is is, is all it matches matches very very well, well to the shadow, yep. mm -hmm. right? Within the shadow of the error. Um, so so again, um, it, it is it is observation. Um, it is an observation based upon many, many radio telescopes over time. They had to do some very clever things because of the motion to try and 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 account for that. Um, there is a next stage where they're going to go and do more detailed motion stuff. They have some some more crosses than they can do, and particularly where they want to try to get is some of the get notion of the magnetic field lines um, like they got on, on 87 and some and refinement of, of the, of the image that way. Yeah. So, so it, it, you, went, you went from, went from a, here's a massive curiosity. I wonder if this exists to um, um, plausible evidence of like Cygnus X1 to very direct evidence because by the time um, I saw the, the stars orbiting Sagittarius A star, and how close it did and how fast it did in its mass, um, I was convinced. I, to me, that was enough data to say that, that, that I, I uh, believe, and in fact, I would say that in, in, in your diagram of knowledge, that we have confirmation that the black hole. And, and this image is further proof of that confirmation, um, adds on to the evidence. So, so, if you if if you don't like the word belief, I would say um, things like you know that 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 we went from a a plausible argument that that black holes exist to um, data that that strongly suggests to you know now observational observational proof that black holes exist and and some of the characteristics around them. Um, and, and so that's again where where what science tries to do um, if if if. You know, when people say, people ask me, do you believe in extraterrestrials? And and my response, because people have different views on what belief means, I would say that um, we don't have we don't have evidence of having communicated with with extraterrestrials, but we have a model to suggest that they almost certainly exist. All right, so, so just for clarification, you were not invited to Eisenhower's summit meeting and you were not involved in Probably Blue Book. You have not been exposed to confidential material that has shown you aliens exist. You can either confirm nor deny this if you so choose. I didn't confirm nor deny okay. I've been in Area 51. Yeah. Even though I know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, don't go there. There's nasty stuff. Yeah, you know, there's nothing There's nothing there relating to aliens. It, uh, it's pretty it's really you know talk things you don't want to get anywhere near there. It, it's it's funny that we're talking about the scientific method because we're going to be getting that in a second here. But it's kind of interesting that you know when we first saw the stellar movement in the the core of the Milky Way, you can see that the stars would go around in a very elongated manner. You could see yeah. the elliptical paths, and you can see that they they started moving faster at certain times when they got closer to the black hole, which would be expected, obviously. And so we. We believe, I mean, I would say it is scientific knowledge, though. And again, this is when we're going to kind yeah. of get into the scientific knowledge. I, th I believe it's scientific knowledge that the only thing that really affects gravity as far as our understanding of these things. And much, I mean, we must say that scientific knowledge is provisional. And that's one of the reasons yes. we're going to have a differentiation between scientific knowledge and, and epistemic knowledge. And, or, and, and also mathematical, so that's and what math we'll talk about yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so when we when when they saw these stars moving the way that they were, they they had to say they had to say to themselves, okay, what causes motion like this? Well, mass and what causes you know grav a distortion in the gravitational field to be specific. And yeah. using those equations, they said, okay, if the only thing we know of that can cause a, a distortion of the gravitational field to see these types of, of movements would be mass, then there has to be a very strong concentrated. Uh, mass in a in yeah. a very small area. I mean, it has to so, be so, there. 
Right. You can measure the amount of mass based upon, right. you know, on 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 by solving equations about based on the on the orbit of of the stars, and and so at that point they knew how much mass was there, and then you when when we had that one star that goes really close and zips in yeah. and out, you know, like a comet thing, a comet like it like, color like and it gets it has a physical effect on the star itself. Yeah. Um, the then you could say that whatever is there has to be more compact than the closest passage of that star. Right. And when you when you look at that density, then Einstein's field equation says you have a black hole. And then this is data directly observing the effect of that hole, if you will, on the world lines coming in. And again, um, understand that, that the space gets really warped around uh, around black holes. This is not a glowy thing behind it and, and, a, and a dot, you know, blocking light. This is this is lines of light that are that are spinning around um, really, really wildly before coming at us. Right. So light that just goes near the edge of a black hole event horizon, but doesn't enter it, will probably orbit, 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 and come out, right? right. It's, it's the lines, the world lines going around this thing are really quite t twisted. And um, now I understand the other thing is that that, that the material that's, that's there, um, if, if you look at the event horizon as one, and let's assume that the central black hole doesn't rotate, then anything that is at three or beyond has a stable orbit. Right, that that you could orbit three times the size of that dot, and and never fall in unless something bumps you, you into give it. Give enough or, energy to do so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas if you go, if, if if it's if it's not spinning, if you go less than three, then you'll eventually uh, be doomed to spiral in and and go beyond the so, point. So, of so the edge, okay, on the on the event horizon, the very edge around it, the innermost stable orbit, right? That that requires a super high amount of energy to stay in a stable orbit, but yes. it's possible. If you, once you go beyond that level, once you, once you ha do not have the energy to maintain a stable orbit and yeah. go anywhere near or closer, you're, you're automatically doomed. There's yeah. no yeah. amount of energy you can spend to go any world path that, that doesn't exist out towards uh, yeah. a so, black hole. So, so material that's within three radii, if, 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 the, if the event horizon is one, of a non-rotating black hole, um, will eventually cross the the, the boundary. Um, so you can have a planet, a st planet with a very stable orbit beyond three that'll orbit it just like it was there and it was a star, right? Um, so it's not as if the, the black hole is some magic vacuum cleaner sucking things in. Um, it is it is a concentrated mass, and that's what makes it a black hole. It's it's it is it is it is basically you know um, create a hole in in space time. That that things go in, but now I mentioned about the long rotating black hole. Um, if you had a black hole that was rotate, the, the stable orbits become one. Um, if the thing was orbiting near the speed of light, right? Um, if uh, so, so, so if, if, if imagine if if this black hole is spinning so fast that that near its equator, it's it's going nine nine point nine 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 percent of speed of light, then you could have stable orbits that are one point zero 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 one radii away. Um, so, so spin has an effect on where the orbits are. But, but given the simulations, now we have mathematical models that say, can we model something to get something that looks like this? And the answer is yes. And those models say that the black hole is spinning somewhat. Yeah, spin and charge also have an effect on the um, yeah the, the world so, timelines as far as space time. Uh, they have two. They, you have one event horizon usually, but because it has spin and charge, it can actually split. You form an outer event yep. horizon and then an inner, where space time diagrams actually invert. So instead of having yes. a path, like, you know, space like travel in limited amount of time, it's just the opposite. You're actually try. It's essentially time traveling and not moving through any space because yeah. the way the, the light cone is actually moved. That, that gets diagram. weird. Yeah, I guess weird, weird. really weird so, stuff. Yeah, so, weird things so happen that, in black that, holes. <laughs> that glowy bit that the image took again is not a simulation; it's actual, it's actually actual image. Mm -hmm. Is is plasma that is that's swirling around, going down the drain, hasn't gone down the drain yet, and and it's going through such violent contortions that is that is that's radiating um, energy. So we see the glow from the material that is that is uh, there now. Um, We'll have a better because they think that 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 this we're seeing the accretion disk edge on. That is that is you have a black hole and the 
from your right, your world point of view, the, 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 the accretion disk is going on like this. But, but why do we see a disk this way? Well, because if you're behind it, light can come over the top and reach you, right? So, so you have this hall of mirrors type thing where you're seeing behind it and light, sometimes even going orbiting multiple times if we're coming towards you, right? You've got something here and, and light goes and then reaches you, right? So, so the, the, the image is, the space is highly distorted. And so don't think of that as just a glowy ball with a, with a, with a shadow in the middle. Um, yeah, you you do have says I was under the impression that super black super massive black holes were much calmer than smaller black holes. It, it really depends if they're feeding or not, or the, you know the quintessence or not. But the thing with larger black holes, I, I, what he might mean is that uh, because of tidal forces on a super massive black hole when it's very 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 large, when you cross that event horizon, you're not experiencing the amount of tidal forces you would on a smaller black hole. If you go, yeah, so, the curvature so you, you is, is is you can is, survive is much a little more bit gentle. longer. Yeah, you can survive a little bit yeah. longer. Eventually, you're screwed, obviously. Yes. But if you were to, to go past the event horizon of a super, super massive black hole, uh, you, you wouldn't even bother you. I mean, you would be, you'd, there's other things that would kill you, obviously, because of the plasma and stuff like that. But I mean, as far as the, the gravitational force, it, it wouldn't even notice. But on a, on a smaller black hole, because it's so small, the gradient from your head to toe of the gravitational field is so great, it would, it would then what they call spaghetti yeah. you. Yeah. And you, you'd probably get uncomfortable approaching when you're very near the edge of the again. So I, I would not recommend yeah. trying. Um, so, but back to the thing about the, the, the uh, knowledge. Um, so we have information and then we have simulations that, that allow us to say, so information that says, yes, um, given the data, there's a black hole mm -hmm. and here are some characteristics. Uh, right now, the question is, how fast is it spinning and what is this charge? Um, and what is the orientation of the accretion disk? Those come from simulations that are paired with the with the the image, right? Yep. So so we don't it, it, that that's a little less. And so they weren't they weren't they didn't come out and say the charge is this, the spin is this. Um, they said these simulations are consistent with a black hole doing this, right? Right. And so they're being kind of careful now. Now they have reason to believe those simulation simulated charge and spin is really the correct um but they have more data to do and so so they're being careful in that way but you might say again belief or the data suggests yeah actually you know what that might be a good time to actually put on the screen here uh let's see if we can transition here i hit it more than once <laughs> um all right, if you're looking at the screen, this is kind of what we want to dive into as far as this particular episode of knowledge. I, mean, I know we got a lot on the one on the black hole, but we, we find that a fascinating subject, so it's quite fine. But um, I did a video a while back, and it was on beliefs. And it, Landon had liked it a lot, and he, like, you know, how can we incorporate the, this into an, a, a show where we kind of explain to people that these words are nothing to be one fearful of but when we're talking about beliefs in science and we're talking about knowledge in science as compri comparative to you know, like philosophy there are some differences and that's that's fine there's nothing wrong with that um scientific knowledge to me and then you know atlantic can agree or disagree but scientific knowledge to me is an embodiment of facts that we believe provisionally to be the case based upon observation we yes. uh, we observe something we have a naturalistic explanation for naturalistic phenomenon. We, we have to be maintain what's called methodological naturalism, which means we cannot assume supernatural causation. We can't posit things like a fairy did it or, or leprechaun did it. Um, it doesn't state that there has to be only natural, right? It's not an ontological or metaphysical naturalism, but it's a methodological naturalism because it's part of the scientific method, which, by the way, was the approach they took when discovering you know, a black hole existed. Same thing with when they, a neutrino, they posited a neutrino, then they discovered a neutrino, a neutron, they posited a neutron exists, yeah. they discovered a neutron. All these things go through a, a you know, a, a, a level of, of confidence that when we say, okay, here's, here's a conjecture, here's a hypothesis, right? So to speak. And, and I'm, you don't even have to be an experimental science to have an hypothesis. But let's say that you don't have a kind of idea that this might be a guess. I, 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 I get slack for this, Landon, but I got to tell you, scientists, <laughs> scientists start with a guess. Scientist, a good scientist will start yeah. with a guess and then build upon that yeah. and, and say, okay, here's my guess. And there's no guesswork in science. Oh, well, every scientist I know so, would probably so, disagree with you. And, and, yeah, and I would say that, that, that what scientists do 
is have what you might term educated guests as yes. opposed to wild ass guests. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 uh, yeah, sure. Or make it out of whole cloth inform, type inform of thing. Guess. Yes. And, and this is back to this thing about when you talk about where it is, you talk about you have a belief um, and, it, and it may fall in that purple area, right? That is that 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 you have in your in your diagram, you know, which which says it's a poorly justified true belief. Right. By poorly justified, meaning they they don't have the evidence to back up the claim. Um, now, I would just I would briefly again, you know, I, I sort of in, implied that that mathematics and science were were were, were destroyed. They're not completely equivalent, but. But remember, a mathematical model doesn't tell the universe what to do, right? Just because of a math that says blah doesn't mean that's what the universe is doing. Now, we've had a number of cases where it, where it turned out to be quite true. Um, um, Dirac um, had equations that suggested that something strange he called antimatter existed. And then later on, the positron, the anti-electron, was discovered. And in fact, it mit, fit the, the the mathematical model that Dirac had had derived for for antimatter. Now we know that antimatter is 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 we have federal evidence that it, that exists. We've created. We've, we've created. We've, yeah, we created. And, positive and we make we make you know and we make uh, um, measurements with antimatter. Uh, but but here's a case where where you know just because a math says this doesn't mean because your mathematical model might have nothing to do with reality. Or might have very poorly correlated with reality. Well, there's right. a lot of mathematical models that, that posit a lot of particles, right? And some of them have been yes. discovered. I mean, that, like the Higgs was, you know, that was positive. Yep. But a lot of particles probably don't exist. They probably are, you know, I mean, strange lits. And, and when you get into super yep. symmetric, I don't. I'm a big fan of supersymmetry. I think I think it's dead. And so that positive yep. particles that I don't think exist. But you know, if you look on the diagram here, right, this Venn diagram. By the way, and and Landon and I do have our own Venn diagram that we have co-developed. It's called the McRae Landon. The diagram, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but um, uh, because he helped me with the legend and it was very succinct, and I was like, I, I love this. Uh, and so in this Venn diagram, you look at the intersection, right? Um, there's this. We'll, we'll make some make some assumptions here, Landon. We'll assume that there is such thing as truth. Okay. Okay. And I don't think yeah. that's an outlandish assumption, right? I mean, if we're going to be talking about something, there's nothing wrong with making assumptions. It's another thing that I run across yeah. when I talk it's your, to it's your axiom. Your axioms. Uh, this is another issue with a lot of atheists. They, for some reason, have this aversion to axioms or to assumptions or to presuppositions because they think of presuppositional apologetics, which is not the same thing. Um, but that's fine. You're building your belief system. You're building your framework, and you must have certain assumptions. The only thing you need to do is justify those assumptions, or in some or, cases, or you may state them. Or, just state them, or just state them yeah, from, axiomatically, so to speak, right? Because yes. <laughs> when somebody says to me, like for example, Landon. Um, You've you've read you my my logical work and in yes you know and and mathematicians and physicists have, and and scientists have you know all across the board have, have read my stuff, but one thing I hate when I hear is you haven't proven your premises, you haven't proven <laughs> your axioms, and I'm like oh god it, no it just no stops. you don't you 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 what you do in mathematics you say here's a set of axioms givens and given the set of axioms what follows derive what what follows right so so. In mathematics, we have something we call a conjecture. And a conjecture, when a mathematician makes a conjecture, they're not just making wild ass guesses and 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 you know it's informed uh, speculation. It 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 is it, when you to, for a mathematician to make a conjecture, they they state something. It's it's a proposition that is proffered without a basis of for formal proof. Mm -hmm. But that's probably true. Most conjectures probably and, but, are. but but the difference between just saying wild ass things and and something which is considered a conjecture is that you you give a line of reasoning that is maybe incomplete that suggests that this is a, this is something to consider right so so when 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 people talk about you know, a a, a um, you know a, a conjecture such as um, you know that 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 conjecture uh, p equals np. Um, what they do is also do is to give a line of reasoning as to why there is one might, what P might equals MP, right? Um, it, the, 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 or, or the Kolox conjecture or something like that is a matter of, 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 
of you give a, a, a plausible line of reasoning, which is not a, not a full of proof. Now, now what will happen sometimes is that conjecture will get turned into hypothesis in mathematics. Hypotheses are conjectures which are fine that, 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 are, that are used in what's called a conditional proof. So, for example, the Riemann conjecture is called Riemann hypothesis because the Riemann hypothesis is used in a lot of conditional proofs. They have these statements that say, if the Riemann conjecture is true, then this follows, mm -hmm. right? You don't know if the Riemann conjecture is true, but but if it is, then you have a you have a proof that 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 shows something else that something else follows. That's yeah, a pretty big deal so that's when, what, when they are proven. And so that's why that's where a hypothesis is basically. You might think a hypothesis is, is a useful conjecture, which uh, is it finds its way into a lot of conditional proofs. So, so again, mathematicians conjecture not because they just guess. They don't sit there and say, "Well, I have three examples; it must be true." Mm -hmm. um, they have a line of reasoning, right, that says because you know because again, um, there's a thing called the strong. The, the 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 strong the the, the strong law of, of small numbers, and eventually this is this says that there are too many demands placed on the small numbers for every every demand to be to be true, mm -hmm. and, and 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 or another way of saying you can't tell by looking. So there's patterns that um, you can run into that might make you might fool you into thinking something is true. Like uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's probably also probably x squared. Minus 40x plus 1, or is x squared plus 40, 41x plus 1? There, there's a, the polynomial like that, where it it generates a bunch of primes consecutively. Well, look at the, okay, use the twin, twin prime conjecture. That'd be a perfect yes. thing, because yeah. the twin prime conjecture looks like it holds. They, they've done yes. it up to, like, I don't know, 400 iterations yeah. or whatever. I mean, they, they've, they've taken the twin prime conjecture and shown for a very, 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 very large amount, correct, that it holds. Yes. But that's not a proof. Yes. And, and so, and so that they don't make uh, the twin prime conjecture is not argued by the basis of, look, we, we searched a while and it seems to be OK. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, there's actually mathematical reasoning that almost outlines a proof, but shows you we don't know this and this. But if this is true, da, 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 you end up sort of giving a, a line of reason, a, a, a reasoned argument that the twin prime conjecture is true. Um, now, for Mott's. Um, conjecture um, about 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 you know that that people think of you you know, you know x to the n plus y to the n equals uh, z to the n for for n greater than two um, doesn't exist uh, given 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 integers and so forth. Um, that was a that was a conjecture on Fermat's part. It didn't become a proof until. Um, until a, a while, wow. uh, actually, it was it was a combination of 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 Wiles and. Well, he, took, he, he found that, from my understanding, he found the missing part using Ricci flow to, to kind of to solve it. I mean, he took bits and pieces and, and he finally put the linchpin in to actually do the proof. But the proof the proof was so complicated. There was like eight people in the world that even knew how to even. To even and, evaluate and, and, it. <laughs> it, 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 it was, but it was a case of of, of that that it turned out. That that his that his proof had a had an error in it. The original one. The original one, and and it was I think it was Taylor, um, um, who who fixed it, right? So so here's a case of mathematicians where they say we well, have a proof. Well, they had a proof that was what he did. It didn't say I proved it. Saying he published um, a proof for peer review. Yeah, you know it should be noted though. Um, it would be said then that that was never proven at that time. It's proven now, but a proof once proven, once something is proven in mathematics, it cannot be unproved. It cannot be disproved. And this is yep. what, again, relating back to the uh, an atheist, because again, atheological a holes. Um, <laughs> when I when when when, when I see an atheist make this fundamental mistake, they say, "Well, we cannot disprove God exists until it's proven God exists." I'm like, you have a fundamental understanding not only of of, of atheology, but you have a fundamental yep. understanding of mathematics. Because if if, yep. if if you could, in theory, prove, um. Uh, God exists, right? Let's say that a theist did prove, uh, however that would be ontologically, but let's just, just go with it, that yeah. God does exist. They, you cannot unprove that. You cannot disprove that. Once something is proven, it is forever proven. What happens is, if they find a mistake in that proof, you say it was never proven to begin with. You, It's called the principle of attribution and retraction that, yes. that uh, Ozzy had kind of coined that I wrote an article on. 
And it's the same thing with knowledge, right? To kind of relate it to knowledge here, you don't say you had a false knowledge. Knowledge by definition must be true. What you say is I never had knowledge to begin with, right? You, 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 you attribute the proposition or the predicate to the proposition belief or knowledge, but if your belief is wrong, we just say, okay, my belief was false. I had a false belief. But if your knowledge was mistaken, you don't say you had false knowledge. You say you never had knowledge to begin with. Same thing with proof. You never proved it yeah. if there's a mistake in it. But once it is proven, so, if it is proven, in fact, it can never be unproven. Part of the process of peer review publication in mathematics is for that peer review. That is someone... Um, makes a, a claim said, you know, I, in fact, they say, I believe this proof, uh, this proof is correct. And so it goes to people who can review it and, and have sort of first line pass. And in the case of, 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 of Vile's proof about Fermat's, um, Fermat's last theorem, um, the, the, there was an error that, that came into was discovered, um, and and it was Taylor, one of the reviewers, that said, "You, you got a problem here," and he then said, "Not only have a problem here, but I think this is how to fix it." And yeah. so he and Biles got together and and repaired the paper and presented a, another paper, which was which which is stood for review. And, 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 and isn't it yeah. kind of interesting to note though? that um, because mathematics is objective, somebody else can actually read it and discover if there's an error in it or not, right? Yes. It's not, it's not a matter of subjectivity. It's not like an opinion piece. Yeah. I write opinion pieces, but I also write things that are more formalized. And for like my atheist semantic collapse argument, that is highly formalized. It is formalized using a strict logical system that Dr. Demi uh, came up with and Dr. Briggs Jackson kind of touched upon. And then also I use Boolean logic uh, to kind of to, to prove this. And so that anybody can go look at. Land has gone looked at it. Other people have gone looked at it. If it has an error in it, it would be objectively been able to be discovered. Now, so far, nobody has. And I'm not saying that it's error free. I, 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 I'm not going to go on and say that, you know, just because you've looked at it or um, Josh Gardner, yeah. who's a mathematician, looked at it or Dr. Malik has looked at it or Dr. Um, well, I can't mention his yeah. name because he was a reviewer, but uh, a, a very a well-known uh, logic expert in the UK, uh, Dalatistic logic, he, he reviewed it. Um, just because they haven't found any errors doesn't mean that there's no error exists, right? Until it's actually published. Once it's published, then I can maybe make the claim that it, it you know, it's a proof, right? I will all claim it's yeah. a proof at the point. Now, now if it's it, discovered it, then, then I'll say it wasn't proven. Yeah. Yes. And, and so, and so the, the notion then about my saying is, is that, by the way, if you want to do the last theorem, because why is it now Fermat's last theorem? Um, because there is a proof that that the conjecture is true. Yeah. Do you so think do you it, think it, that Fermat actually? Because he wrote in the um, side notes that he basically did this, and I hate these things, but he basically said the proof is left up to the reader because it's so simple, kind of stuff. He said he, well, you know, he actually annotated that he had a you know a simple proof for it. What he said, what he said in, in writing in his book, because people used to write in books about about their notations, is that I've come up with a marvelous proof for which the margin of this book is too small to contain, implying he was going to write it down. He never late. Did. And 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 given what we think it's required to to prove he was probably wrong that's conjecture um he probably discovered an error and 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 didn't didn't yeah. write it down yeah. but 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 in order to understand Fermat's, you know the proof of Fermat's last theorem um you really need to understand elliptic curves and modular forms and and i would start off because I, I i disagree there's 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 more than seven people um, <laughs> I don't, originally, there was a lot. Proof. He, I mean, he cared, He had to come up with his own form of mathematics, so to speak. Well, but you had to. You had to. You had to create a bunch of things. Yeah. To, 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 Maybe to, now to, they did, there's more, but back then there but, wasn't probably a hell of a lot. <laughs> but 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 there were certainly. Um, I think it. You know, um, Shira and and I was going to say it's T. Tayayama, I think is his name. Um, had had various ideas. Around this area about how elliptic curves and modular forms relate. So, if you understand the proof, um, study elliptic curve theory and study modular forms, and then you will be able to understand the basis for which um, Tamiya Shamira Weil conjecture was was made, and then you'll understand the proof 
uh, on that conjecture that that led to the yeah, ellipti well, elliptical mathematics is, is and, hard. And, and, <laughs> and it, 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 it's not so, so bad, but modular forms is really quite is 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 a thing to itself. So um, I would say at the time my, uh, at the time that that his his he originally he he he, he um, submitted his first proof. Um, there were a small number of mathematicians that were skilled enough to find the error. Um, nowadays, given the proof house lines, there there is you know, a number of mathematicians with advanced mathematics. It's, it's quite a number of them who understand modular forms and elliptic curves sure. and, and and the conjecture and say yes, I can, they can follow the proof. So there's a difference between being able to come up with the first place and being able to follow it and 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 see the reasoning. Right. So. Back to the thing with mathematics statistician. So conjectures are are really educated lines of reasoning that are not a considered solid proof. Now you might say, well, then what is a proof? And and there are some mathematicians that sort of in a, in a joking sort of way says a map, a proof is a statement that's accepted by the majority of math departments of uh, universities around the world, right? And and that's kind of a uh, theory of knowledge that sort of says, well, how do we know this proof is true? And the answer is, if it gets past peer review and 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 mathematical departments, mathematicians, many mathematicians go and say, yes, 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 um, you have a pretty yeah, good... I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that's not even, you know, people say, oh, that's a fallacy of appeal to popularity. It's not. I mean, we, and that's a, a misconception of the argument um, of... Or the say the fallacy of argumenting ad populum. When you're dealing with experts um, and there's consensus, when they have evaluated the the, the yeah. proof, then no, that's not an argument ad populum. Actually, and and by the way, it's not a vote. You're right. It's right. not a vote. Right. It's not just to say once 50 percent of math departments agree, right. it's considered true. Right. Um, if there's a if a mathematician comes up and has a very strong reasoning and publishes something that survives peer review, saying, "Hey, that proof is wrong." Mm -hmm. Then, then it only takes one to sort of veto if that one presents credible. Well, I'll give you a perfect uh, example of that. Um, on this channel, I had had Dr. Hinky and Dr. Um, Lachelle come on, and we talked about healing infusion rates um, quite extensively. Mm -hmm. That, for a very long period of time, we had a back and forth between many people, um, including myself, facilitating with Dr. Humphreys from the uh, Creation Research International or. Mm -hmm. Genesis or CMI. He's from. He does work with with all of them. But he's a he's a very well known uh, younger creationist astrophysicist. And um, in his one of his writings, he had published in the in the Journal of Creation. He made a math error, and Dr. Lachelle pointed out this math error by publication of of the math error in another journal, one that was actually peer reviewed. We all know that the Journal of Creation is not peer reviewed. Okay, um, mm -hmm. but. Uh, if you go to the journal creation, I believe it was uh, uh, number 43, uh, Humphreys, it talks about um, healing infusion rates and discussion with Dr. Lachelle and, and myself. And be because he made this error, it was it was noted by somebody who was an expert in the, in the field. Um, and so he had pointed out to Dr. Humphreys, but Humphreys didn't want to recognize that he made a math error. Uh, younger creationists seems to be very, very uh, slow on uh, trying to, to say that they, you know, Trying to admit they made an error, but you did, he did exactly what you said. He had mm -hmm. he had objectively found a, a it was actually a pretty simple math error too, um, mm -hmm. and so instead of going to like younger creationist and, and journal creation, which he did, he tried to say, look, you know, there's an error here. They didn't weren't having any of it. They didn't care there was an error. He published in a credible journal, right? And and that showed that anybody now that can go read and I don't remember the journal he published published in. But anybody can now go to that journal and say, oh, look, yes, Dr. Lachelle was right. The math is the math. The math is objective. He found the error. Now, whether Humphreys wants to retract his paper or, um, you know, acknowledge there's a math error, that's, that's up to him, right? But the fact that it was an objective mathematical error dealing with the differences between natural logarithms and, and 10 base T logarithms, um, anybody can go do this if you are sufficient enough of knowledge to... to one, find the error and be able to publish on it. A Flame of $5 mm -hmm. says, Landon, do you know about Bill Gade, his magic rope, and his phantom thread? Would you call him a mathematician? Math ma magician? Um, I, 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 I never crossed paths with, with Bill. Thank you, um, I, know of, I know of him, and thank you very much for that donation. Um, and that mathematician 
um, is something I think that that um, I would say people um, such as Martin Gardner. Oh God, I love or, Martin Gardner. Or, or right. even James Randi, who was also was was pretty proficient yeah. as a mathematician, right? That they they incorporate in um, uh, deception, flaws in perception, and 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 facts and bring them I, together, I grew right? Up reading Martin Gardner's book, and and yes, he was he was a very influential person. Um, I. Um, I only went to a lecture uh, of his. I didn't really, you know, know or meet him, but but yes, fantastic person. Um, so so yes, I, I would say probably yes. You would call him a mathematician, right? Um, as people who um, very clever uh, uh, stuff for for there 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 are there are some some pretty good mathematicians out there as as well. Um, and uh, yeah, they, you know, um, they, have, they call them mentalists too. Mentalists will actually do tricks, um, you know, using math. Um, so, so you know, so let's look like at the stand-up math guys as a good example of, of stuff. Um, or or Rizot's another, you know, good math magicians that, that show you stuff and 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 uh, number file. Yes, number file. So, number file yeah. is really good. Um, all right, so 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 let's look at this from from a, a epistemological point of view when we talk about knowledge. Okay, sure. Because this is you know what my my other video I talked about. There are many different types of theory of knowledge. There's no one size fits all. However, the most common one generally understood, somebody mentioned this in the, the live chat, is justified true belief. Now, we all know mm -hmm. that yes, justified true belief is not perfect. No theory is perfect when it comes to these things. Deal with it. It's just, yeah. you have you have to start somewhere. You have to work with something. And of course, there's no perfect theory. If there was, then we would only have one. But there are many types of theories. But the most common is justified true belief. And because of the Gideon problems, there are, there are obviously situations where yeah it may not be the best approach to use as far as what determines knowledge but that's again philosophy um i think that many things can be overcome with the Gettier problems using um possible world semantics okay you they're called uh, sensitivity and safety conditions they're truth tracking conditions but be that as it may um it's still relatively common to to accept what we mean by knowledge by saying there's three conditions to be met right and these are pretty standard. I, I don't know why anybody would really argue them. Uh, it, it does make knowledge a subset of belief, which some people will have pushback on. And I don't understand why they don't want knowledge to be a subset of belief, except when they equivocate the word knowledge. And they're using it differently. They're using it in, in a different sense of the word knowledge, as far as, in this case, what we're talking about, scientific knowledge, or it's called explicit knowledge. That's not the same thing. Explicit knowledge and scientific knowledge is not the, what we're talking about. Uh, the word knowledge when you read it in a philosophy paper. Mm -hmm. So the three things on the tripartite analysis of knowledge requires three conditions, right? One, the proposition is true, mm -hmm. which I, again, I think yeah. that's a very fair axiomatic yeah. that we went back to begin yeah. with that we have to assume there are truths, right? There are axioms. You have to assume there's truths. That you believe that is true, right? I mean, what's the point of having something that's true if you don't believe it? If we say, look, I, I know this to be true, but I don't believe it, which I've had atheists do <laughs> multiple times, um, it, it sounds odd, right? And, yeah. and I, I hate playing this game of gotcha land, and I really, really hate it because I'm trying to get an atheist to think about what they're coming across to a theist. And as non-believers, we are in that same tribe, right? So if, if, if a non-believer is looking like an idiot to a theist, it reflects poorly on the rest of the non-believers. Just like when you have some kind of radical theist, it looks bad on the more mainstream theist. And so when you say something like, I know this is the case, but I don't believe it, doesn't it, it, it sound so odd? Because you're like, wait a minute, why would you say you know something? Like, let's say A equals A, the law of identity. If all of X equals, equals X equals X, which is a, a fundamental a priori knowledge, you say you know that, but you don't believe it. It it raises the question is, what is it you don't believe about it? And and this is back to think of, I think some people do this because they're so, either they see that the belief is so pejorative mm -hmm. or they're so afraid of the word belief um, because other people misuse it by saying, you know, I believe, you only believe in, in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, that kind of stuff. They, they, they so, uh, that so revolts them that they're afraid to, to, to get belief anywhere in there. Now, yeah, they, understand. They, they, I don't have, I don't have beliefs, right? They're like, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't have, I don't have any kind of yeah. beliefs. Okay. Well, that's just 
fall. Well, I mean, I mean it's, it's a matter of saying, you know, that, 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 that the dictionary definition, descriptive definition and belief includes this ontological thing we're talking about, but also includes some of the other things that are less, that are, that are more fuzzy, because that's what language does. Um, but in this particular case, um, the thing is true, you believe it's true, and you're justified in believing it, is, is, a, is a good theory of knowledge. Now, with the case of mathematical conjecture, mathematical conjectures are with if two and three hold, but one doesn't. That is, you, the mathematician believes something is true, and has justified in believing it. But, but they haven't confirmed it's true. Haven't confirmed it's true. Mm -hmm. So conjectures are are, are quite um, are great. But 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 again, but that's if it's, a, if it's proven. If it's proven, that, then, then, then you then meet it, all the conditions. Then, to, to, right? then it elevates to 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 a theory. Yeah, a theorem, right? Uh, a proof, right? Proof. That that is that is that the theorem is the thing that 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 proves the statement. And and so if a conjecture that has just two and three on that you see on the list um, is is used to create what's called conditional proofs, like if three and a half pa either uh, Riemann conjecture is true, then these things fall right. That kind of conditional that's not a proof. It says if if this is true, it's called a conditional implication. Yep. Yes. Then 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 that's where a conjecture elevates to a hypothesis. Um, in mathematics. Now, again, from the case of the world of, of in physics, just because you have a proof, mathematical proof of something, doesn't mean that's what the reality does. Mm -hmm. Because there's that is that that gap between that's what makes it provisional, the logical to the actual. Right? There's a gap there that that that, that you have to to span and that physicists go through to say so. So Einstein was 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 quite scientifically proper to be skeptical of the existence of black holes, skeptical of the existence of gravitational waves, or even the ability to detect them. Um, and 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 later on, of course, um, he became he was what over on the black hole thing. And of course, if he's still alive today, seeing the gravitational wave detectors. Um, he would have said, wow, you know, that's that's amazing, right? It wasn't the case that he was wrong. He was justified in his skepticism. He believed there could be a reason why black holes don't exist because he knew the math was not the thing that drives the universe. Okay, so when they discovered the gravitational waves, right, they had been predicted with LIGO, uh, mm -hmm. and LIGO was developed yeah. to, to, to actually show that they do, in fact, exist. They have an ontological presence. At that point, it becomes scientific knowledge, right? At that point, we can yes. say it's, it's scientific knowledge. But in philosophy, it's a little bit different because a skeptic, right? A, an actual skeptic, not, not what you would think of, of, oh, I just doubt everything. Not, not these, yeah. th these, these online atheists, they confuse actual skepticism with denialism. And denialism is not the same thing. They, they basically just will not accept anything uh, regardless of, of any evidence. Mm -hmm. And they just their whole shtick is just deny, deny, deny. It's a form yeah, of denialism. Yeah. But there are true skeptics out there that hold that knowledge is unobtainable. We don't have actual knowledge, but they're not talking about it in the scientific sense. A sense, a, a, a science, uh, even as even a, a Peronian skeptic, I personally would think, look, um, we yeah. can't know anything in the epistemological sense, but we have added to the body of evidence and science to say we have scientific knowledge of gravitational waves. But again, this is the differentiation of the terms, and there's a non-overlapping ministeria, so to speak, of them. I, I don't like when, when people conflate knowledge when we're talking about, you know, belief systems. We're talking about the God's ontology. But, you know, we're going to use the, 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 the term knowledge and belief in some other domain of discourse and carry it over. I think that's hmm. a dishonest approach to these conversations because, as you had pointed out, some atheists, some people out there going, oh, I don't have any beliefs. I call it dosastic nihilism. That's my term <laughs> for it, right? Because they just don't believe that for some reason they have beliefs. But when they do that— they're one sounding just ignorant. You can't say, "Look, I I don't believe A equals A," and not think that somebody's going to think you're an idiot, right? There has to be some kind of justification for your beliefs. Even even denying something, or I shouldn't say denying, because denying means that you actually hold something false. But even not accepting a proposition, this is what actually got me started um, on Facebook yesterday with this guy who was arguing about the burden of proof, and he made a video about it, and I would probably do a review on that video. But he didn't understand really the conceptualizations of burden and proof from any kind of physical, uh, uh, philosophical position. And of course, he was just regurgitating what he had heard about burden and proof. 
But yeah. here's the thing. If you did not, if you, excuse me, if you don't accept something to be true, yes, you have a burden of proof. Even though you have not made a positive epistemic claim, you have made a statement that you are not accepting something as a condition of rationality, right? So if I said to you, if you posited to me, Landon, hey, look, Steve, A equals A, and I say, I don't believe you, Landon, you have every right to think that I'm irrational. Yes. Now, now, but, 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 let's say I justify that, and I say, uh, hey, Landon, I don't know what equality means. I don't know what this equal sign means. I, I don't. This, oh, more specifically, let's use, let's use uh, first order logic. If you showed me an upside down A, right? Which some people, you know, mm -hmm. they, my my viewers know what it is, but but the average person is not going to know what a, what a quantification is, right? They're not going to know mm -hmm. what what, what all, all of X means, you know. Yes. So, but let's say they they have this quantifier and they have an upside down X and an X and then you have parentheses X equals X. You and I would recognize that clearly as all of X X equals yes. X, which is a law of identity. For all of X X equals X, right? Right. We yes. know how to read. We know how to read that particular uh, syntax, but. To somebody who doesn't know what that syntax means, then they, when you present that to them and you say, hey, look, here's an upside down A, A equals A, and somebody says, I don't believe you on that, and you ask them, well, well why? Because you would think, again, you're irrational if you don't accept the law of identity. But if they say, hey, well, I don't know what that symbol means, now they've just justified their position. Yes. They've justified them not believing yeah. that particular yeah. thing because they're not I understanding what it is, right? Yeah. Now, but that's a burden of proof. That is literally have, what a burden of proof is in epistemology. There. So I have, you know, I, I remember it was it was Robinson, the logician who, with Lamer, found the first computer generated, uh, discovered Mersenne's from two to five, two to five twenty one power up to two to the two to eight one minus one power, right? Or it was it was the five Mersenne's that 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 Robinson and Lamer. Um, Produced, and I meant to say the Lucas Lamer test was a was a theorem that showed that two to the p minus one is prime if and only if a certain condition was true, right? And, and this is the thing where it, it a lot of times in primality proofs, instead of going through the burden of failing to find a factor, you show a number has a property that only primes have, and and therefore you prove it's prime. So you sh so so the Lucas Lamer test. Your, that's what you did in your paper, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you go and say this number um, is prime proof. Mm -hmm. This number has a property that only primes have. Here's the proof of that property. Therefore, it's true. Okay. Right. That's, people that's, may not know you've discovered uh, the 25th and 26th. Mersen. Mersen prime. Um, yeah, I've read your paper. By the way, it's really small. Your, your paper's short. <laughs> Yes. Yes. It's pretty <laughs> to the point. It's, um, it's very, it's compactified. It's like, Hey, this, this, and this, it's, it has a property of prime, therefore it's prime. Move on. Have a nice day. <laughs> yes. And, 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 um, and I can show you in a movie, the proof of the, so in some ways it was a computer constructed proof. Um, you could say, well, did I prove it? No, I did not go through the calculations of those you 6,500, you, you know, 30,000. You showed a property that only primes could have. That's all. Yeah, and and then I have so and I had so in verify it was Emma Lamer and 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 D H Lamer, right, the world famous mathematicians that that came and said yes, Landon's proof is correct, and and based upon that I then I then published in mathematics and computation. But but again, um, the 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 notion of of that of that proof was showing. That it, you know, again, primality says that this number has a property that only prime numbers have. Now, there's a thing. Um, this this guy named Robertson was a was an extraordinary uh, logician, right? He was a he was a mathematical logician of 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 of, of amazing uh, renown. And um, give you an example of, of of just how good this guy guy was. Um, so I believe that the work they did was in 1950. Was it 52 or 57? Um, when they when they did this work, when when um, uh, Lamer and Robinson got together and say there's this machine early 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 earlier computer called SWAC, right? It's one of the one of the first one of the original early digital computers back in the 50s, and um, and Robinson was getting a book on how to uh, on the on the theory of operation, the, the instruction codes, the binary instruction codes um, for how this machine worked, and he constructed a proof. By by programming the machine code of this machine, you didn't have terminals down the line at the time. You just had essentially. In fact, he wrote on paper and had a, a typist type in the, the 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 binary code for his program to do the calculations necessary to construct the proof. And 
And this was the first program that, that Robinson ever wrote, right, was a proof. And, and, and it found 2 to the 521 power minus 1 is prime, all the way up to 2 to the 228, uh, 1 minus 1 is prime. It, it proved the, the prime of those numbers. And, and the amazing thing is his first program he ever wrote in his life um, on one of the early computers, and it worked correctly the first time. You didn't have to right? debug it. <laughs> it it worked correctly, right? And 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 people later on, remember I say, I, I remember meeting him, you know, in the in the nineteen in in the nineteen uh, late nineteen seventies, and said, you know, wow, you know, how did you manage to do this? And he said, well, I'm a mathematician. Why would I prove something wrong? Right? I I I did it correctly. Mm-hmm. What's what's the big deal? Write your program correctly. And so he did a logical step on on the thing, and 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 it you know, the machine code reads like a proof. And he just wrote it correctly. It's just, just, just that you know. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> Here's the brilliant stuff. Yeah. So, so um, I want to talk about um, theory, right? Because belief is one of those per- things that gets pejoratized. Um, theory also gets pejoratized um, by another group of people. When people talk about the theory of evolution, mm-hmm. or 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 the theory of, of of you know the 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 big you know theory, theory of, of gravity, of the universe, or theory of gravity, or something like that. Um, um, and people say, well, it's just a theory. Um, to me, uh, that suggests they don't understand what a theory is. I don't see it as much as I used to. Uh, I, I used to, growing up, that was big, back with the chick tracks and things of that nature. There was a lot more pushback than there is nowadays, I think. I think most people, yeah. when they see that, they, they consider it a prat, a point refuted a thousand times. So when they yeah. see something like, uh, somebody going, oh, well, theory is just a guess, most people don't give it much, much stock. But- but in knowledge stuff, a scientific theory explains why a phenomenon occurs. A scientific law, on the other hand, describes what the phenomenon what phenomena will happen. So theory talks about explains why a phenomenon occurs, and so um, the the theory of gravity explains why objects fall towards other mass objects like like the Earth. Um, scientific law describes what phenomena will happen, and when where theory and knowledge, where theory and law come together, is when repeated successful predictions can confirm the theory um, by seeing you know observation. So that describing phenomena will happen is observation that um, relates to. It. So you can have descriptions of phenomena happens, but you don't have a theory behind it. Um, could you say this happens? We don't understand it. Yeah, I would. I, I, would have, even, I would even argue that theories don't even describe laws. Uh, for example, like why do we have a certain law? It's not up to a scientific theory. That's in the domain of philosophy. Philosophy will, yes. will, is more uh, reasons why these particular laws exist. Yeah. Right. I and mean, so the, the the theory will codify the law. Right. It'll 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 codify it in a way we can make predictive uh, ability have predictive ability to say okay. Given these conditions, given these numbers we stick into these formulas, we can make a prediction of what will happen. And these laws seem to be consistent on that. But when you ask the question, why do these laws even exist? You're no longer in science. You're in the domain of philosophy. Yeah. That's the philosophy yeah. of science. Now, yeah. And so the other thing about you say about in a theory is that you're going to have theories for which you don't that, that you don't have observations. Right. Um, so you might say um, that you've got you've got justification for it. String theory. Like yeah, string theory, yeah, right? But but it doesn't have yet the falsability, falsifiability. For example, um, it's one of the things that string theory lacks. It lacks a pre- novel prediction, right? That is that is um, this is this is what this is what relativity did. What Einstein did with the Einstein experiment is that Einstein made a described ahead of time. A phenomenon about stars near the sun's light being bent, and that he's and he's and he said during a solar solar eclipse, when the moon's covering the sun, you can see the stars near the edge. That the positions of those stars will be um, will be bent. The line the light front will be bent, and the stars will appear closer to the sun than they actually are when when the sun moves away. And you, you take a picture of nighttime. So so what Eddington did was took, took photographs of a star field where the eclipse is going to occur and then went to, I think it was in South America, 
where um, they photographed during the eclipse with a large telescope and they compared two images and found that the that the stars closer to the edge of the of the eclipse were were bent in. They were they were they were distorted. They were they were um, they, they appeared to be closer to the sun than they otherwise would. Right. So that describes a phenomenon, and it was that that people said, well, this nice theory that Einstein came up with all this math appears to be pretty good because it pre it predicted something novel. It was his Einstein's theory was consistent with what what Newton did. Mm -hmm. And it, it it explained things like the precession of Mercury, and it explained of and 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 it and it and it, and it predicted a phenomenon that they went out to an eclipse and found that it was true. And and that to me that is basically how they go about saying a theory is confirmed, right? They never say yes. a theory is proven, right? No scientific theory is provable. You don't want a provable because again, if they're provable, you cannot adjust them, change them modify them or have provisional yeah. uh, knowledge yeah. or provisional facts. And so we don't want scientific theories to be proven. What we want them to be is malleable. We want them to be able to incorporate new data consistently. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that like the falsification criteria is a bit overrated. The reason being is what's called a confirmation of holistic confirmation, which when you have holistic confirmation or confirmational holism, yeah. the, the thing with that is there's always some, some kind of escape hatch with most theorems. You can incorporate new data by modifying your theory appropriately to have an escape hatch yeah. from many types of, types of theories. For, for, not all, but look what happened with Newtonian physics, right? When Newtonian physics did not describe certain things properly, like the retrograde motion of Mercury, we didn't shit can it. We didn't say, oh, look, Newton's theories are all wrong, right? There, there's a whole, there's a, there a, 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 a escape hatch where Einstein came in and said, oh, look, yeah, it doesn't describe this. However, my theory does. My theory incorporates Newtonian physics, but adds more um, of an in-depth yeah. understanding based upon instead of having gravity thought of as a force, let's think of it as an actual space-time curvature. It was a it was a mind shift. It was it was literally one of those times where you have a paradigm shift in science. Yes, right? and so it didn't discount Newtonian physics. It didn't falsify. Newtonian physics. What it did was it yes. took information we already knew from observations. It threw yeah. a ball. We knew it made a parabolic curve, although technically it's an elliptical, but the math is mm -hmm. much more complicated. But we, we, we saw these things. Newton, Newton recognized these things in orbital mechanics. And so, so when, when we have these scientific theories, we build upon them, but they're never, never proven, but they are confirmed. Like the, the observing of the star with respect to the solar eclipse, it did not yeah. be, it wasn't where it was supposed to be, visually speaking. The light was bent. Who predicted this? It wasn't Newton that predicted it. It was Einstein's equation that predicted it, right? Yes. And that's yeah. that, and and it was a confirmation of his theory that, oh, there's something to it. Exactly. So so in the case of you, it wasn't that, that Newton was wrong. Right. It was that his description of phenomenon, the description of the phenomenon that, that comes from his theory, Newton's theory, was incomplete. And so, and so the, the, the Newton's, you know, um, you know, F, G, M, and M2 or R squared, um, that still, you know, that, that, that sort of theory was sound, but you needed some, and, 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 and to, to normal observations, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. But, but when you get these sort of relativistic effects, then it actually, uh, you know, then you find phenomenon happen. In fact, you know, part of the thing is is um, is it participating in is a Parker space probe. It's a space probe that goes in close to the sun. To, to its principal use is to is to measure uh, effects of the corona, right? And under studying studying the 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 gases that are coming off the materials coming off the surface of the sun, very close to the sun. And um, on this probe is a very accurate clock, an atomic clock. And and when Earth and the probe synchronize clocks as best they can, then the then the probe goes into towards the sun, zips around, and comes back out, and it becomes the 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 the, the fastest moving macroscopic object that humans ever created. I think the last the last its last speed record was it reached about three hundred and twenty thousand kilometers an hour, which is which is about um, one three thousand five hundred of the speed of light, right? It's it's a it's a one over three five zero zero is about the the again not speed of light, but 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 it's the fastest thing we've we've made. And and that that um, space probe as it goes in 
toward dies in toward the sun and comes back out and counters a strong gravitational field. It's it's its speed and the gravitational field are are what they're produces relative, they're time. Rel there's relativistic effects for time dilation. Relativistic time dilation. Mm -hmm. And so when that when the, when the probe comes back out and we do a sync, we find oh the clock is different than ours. Not that it's wrong. The clock on that probe is very accurate. And from if you're sitting on the probe, you would just see time ticking by just normally. And if you look back at the Earth, you say, hey, Earth's clock is is is, is wrong. Yeah, right? as a matter of fact, we'll have to do another episode. And guys, um, I'll, I'll ask the live chat um, when this video uploads. Go in the comments section and um, tell Landon that we want him back. Uh, we get, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I get Landon all the time, obviously. He's one of my best friends, and I love the man to death. Um, but you know, he has, he has other things in his life. <laughs> I mean, so, yes. I mean I, he's, he's a very busy guy. You guys don't even know what happened. I can't tell you what he does, obviously. Yes. But I mean, the dude's a busy guy. He's, he's yeah. you know, he's, he's a well-known expert. In but, uh, you know, if you guys want to see him on, I think one of the things that we actually may into next time is simultaneity and, and yes, uh, you know, because <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know if you've heard of Jason Lyles. He's a mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So Jason Lyles had basically has this theory in young creationism on asynchronous light transmission, and what yes. he does is he basically exploits um, a, a thing in philosophy. It's not even a matter of physics. He's not even doing physics really. What he's doing is philosophizing, and he's not wrong per se. And I and I know people are going to say, well, uh, how can you say young creationism is not wrong on that? Because what he's doing is just exploiting an axiom, right? And he's changing, saying, okay, maybe the axiom is wrong, which he's perfectly allowed to do. He could philosophize. But what I think he fails is he has no reason to justify the substitution of the axiom. Yes, and 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 also the other tricky thing is that that speed of light has been been measured on a round trip. We haven't figured out how to do one I don't know, way. I don't know if you can I, I don't. The reason being, we is, don't know how to do that. Yeah, I, I, and I we may not ever be able to figure out how to do that because we have to make a certain assumption that light travels yeah. and propagates equally in all directions. Right. True. But here's here's the thing where, you know, I, I try to be careful when I make my statements because, um, you know, I, I say I don't understand the physics that would allow uh, one way light transmission. Right. I'm not going to say that someone clever can't do it. Right. Same sort of thing. When people say, can you go faster than speed of light? Is warp drive possible? My answer is I don't understand the physics that would allow that. I don't say it's wrong. I say I wouldn't well, understand the physics here, that would here's, that here's, permitted to happen. But here's the thing on asynchronous light transmission: the equations absolutely allow it. I mean, it it, it it's, there's no violation. Yeah. You could say that light instantaneously travels from us to like Mars, right? Yeah. And on the way back, it takes you know twice the speed of or, you know whatever the speed of light, twice the speed of light. So <laughs> it, the average is c, right? But you yes. but we, we could be it could be any variation of that. And so when yeah. we say, oh yeah. Light's traveling instantly. There's nothing in the equations that show that it can't. But we have, yeah. we have in philosophy have this axiom that says, okay, what makes more sense here? Law of, like parsimony. You don't want to multiply your your entities uh, without without yeah. reason uh, unnecessarily. So when we say, okay, um, why would I think that light travels instantly, instantaneously between two points one way, but then takes longer on the way back? What is about you know reality that would cause such a thing? What what makes our location special special that we for some reason, don't have light traveling in the same direction uh, both ways, and there's just no reason to accept that. You know, a non yeah, and and because because I you know, axiom. I, on that particular lecture, um, I appeared on Dapper Dino. I don't know. I hope you don't mind my plugging his no, channel. Of not. Yeah, he's, a, he's, great. A, he's a he's a uh, great dude. Um, and and we went through a process of 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 playing his lecture to me and my commenting on his stuff, and and. And and while yes, there's this round trip versus one way light stuff, the games he plays, the semantic games he plays, and stuff he does is, was 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 really quite um, sad, right? Mm -hmm. And so so yeah. so I agree with you that the one way versus round trip light speed is doesn't doesn't is not an argument for this in earth creation and stuff. Um, that lecture was full of really gross distortion. I really want to do a subject on that. And by the way, I, I apologize. <laughs> Somebody had just noted that I was only come, uh, coming across on one channel. I uh, had one of my mods noted that earlier. I could have fixed that, and I just did. So I apologize yeah. for the, the audio. Yeah. I don't want to channel. Sorry. I, I fixed that by downcoding uh, mono. Uh, I, have, I know of the problem, uh, and I know a workaround, but I, I do apologize. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, but sorry, yeah. trademark Canada, by the way. You have to a boot. A boot. <laughs> a boot. 
<laughs> uh, a couple things on the live chat, if I can go over real quick. Uh, Adam sure. says, excellent discussion. We do appreciate that. Uh, it's always amazing when Landon comes in. You cannot have a bad discussion with Landon. I don't think it's even Aww. like possible. <laughs> uh, when I say he's one of my all-time favorite people, I'm not even being close to mm -hmm. hyperbolic. He is like the most incredible man I've ever met. Uh, him am, and, and my other friend, Bull. And you guys, yeah, Bull. It's from Pures to Bull, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Adam says, I have a hard time seeing how the burden of proof is anything other than a sort of social norm or expectation. Where does this burden have come from? Who makes these rules? Well, they're not necessarily a rule. Okay, even with Grice's maxims, just mm -hmm. Grice's maxims were not prescriptive. They were descriptive. They could be flaunted. So when we're talking about burden of proof, there's many different usages and there's many different types of burden of proof. There's no one size fits all. But I think these things kind of make sense from a cursory point. Even in the legal system, people are like, oh, well, burden of proof which comes from... Uh, uh, um, Oh, um, upper, uh, was it um, operandi upper, upper, operandi, right? Um, okay. So that that basically is only because we're saying, look, we want the legal system to make the case that, that the man is guilty because we find it because of a judicial infelicity or judicial um, error that we send an innocent man to jail. We find it morally egregious for an innocent man to go to jail more so than a, a guilty man to go free. We'd rather have a guilty man go free. So there's a there's there's a there's a thing in our in our system where we say, okay, we want to make sure that this person, beyond a reasonable doubt, is guilty. So the burden of proof is on the the prosecutor to determine that that person has sufficient evidence to be sent to jail. However, there's nothing in the legal system that says the defense does not have a burden. It's literally called the burden of defense. Or burden yes. of rejoinder, or burden of, of, of response. There's a couple of ways that you can describe it, but it overall is that the defense has a burden as well. It, it, think about this: if 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 you were on trial and your defense attorney just sat there and did nothing and said, "Oh, it's all on him to prove it," right? <laughs> that would no. make no sense, right? <laughs> no. But there's a difference in understanding. The burden of proof is on the prosecution to determine guilt, but there are other burdens out there which are also called burden of proof. One of which is called the burden of production, which means you have a certain burden to bring charges um, to, the, to the court. Have you met that mm -hmm. yet? If not, you're going to get it dismissed. There's a burden of persuasion, which means you do have enough um, evidence to persuade the judge and jury or your interlocutor. There's evidential burdens to say, look, here's my evidence for this. There's my discursory burdens to say, look, I want to convince you of this. I want to burden persuasion. I want to convince you that what I'm saying is correct. There's all these different burdens, right? But as we're talking about beliefs, if, if Landon would have asked me a question, hey, Steve, do you believe aliens exist? Do you believe that intelligent life exists? And yeah. I just said to, Bert, to Landon, yeah, I, I, I do. I think, there's, I think there's other life out there. Somewhere. Do I, have I set up a, a discursory burden with him, engage with him to give him all my evidence as to why I believe that? No, I have not. I merely have given him a self-reflective sure. state. I've merely given him my, what's called in my belief box what's in there, right? I, it's an autobiographical assessment. I'm only relating to him based upon his question to me. Yes, I ticked that off in my, in my box. Now, am I trying to convince him that aliens exist? No, right? I mean, that's yeah. a completely different you know, thing, right? But it goes the same thing, when we, and I hate to always bring it back to like atheism and theism, but that's what this show is actually kind of about. But, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but again, when a theist yeah. says, theist says, when you say, hey, do you believe in God? And a theist says, yeah, I, I believe God exists. They have not set up a compact with you, discursory wise to give you all their justifications why God exists. You have no right at that point to say, oh, okay, prove it. Now you're straw manning them. But if a theist says, I can prove God exists, then you do have a, a right as far as discursory to say, okay, can I see that proof? They, they don't have to show it to you. Um, they have not set up that compact with you if they're not trying to persuade you. But at that point, you can say, well, yeah, I, I, I'm convinced that you yeah. do not have proof uh, of that. Um, I, I believe that you don't have proof. Right? You, and just perfect so, so, someone's, so someone says, I know God exists, then they're making a claim that um, you might say there's a burden of saying, well, well, how do you know? How do you prove? What's, what's, what's your justification for it? You're, you're actually putting a burden on them to justify that claim. And if they don't, then you just don't accept. You just say, okay, well, you know, I believe that you're, you have a, a claim to knowledge that you're not justified to make. That's all. Simple. Yeah. And, yeah. and by the way, that's, you that's, be, that's your burden. Yes, you met your burden. And, yeah. <laughs> now, now also a slight thing of, of of there with his logician stuff. Um, when you talk about you know the, the tautology of, of of a equals a, um, I can mathematically say I have a axiomatic system for which, for some value of a, a does not equal a. Right. 
Okay. And I can build a mathematical system about it. Now, when you Would do it be that, no, <laughs> no, you find you find little kind of problems there. Right. So, so, so in, in 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 mathematical systems, you can come up with your own axioms. But whether anyone paid attention to find them useful is 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 in what they produce. Yeah, I mean, I I would I would I do think there are some uses for paraconsistent logics where you have a proposition could be false at the same time. There are systems that are useful to have that, and and uh, I think that when people start having absolutes, we're saying, oh, you know, p and not p can never be true at the same time. Uh, that's a contradiction. Therefore, if people know with the principle of explosion, you can prove anything. That's fine in classical, but. Don't negate the fact that there are other logics that are used for other things. Yeah. Because not everything is black and white in the, in, not everything is cut and dry, you know? Yeah, but you don't be so pedantic, do you say, yeah. but ex assuming you're axiomatic systems, right? You, you typically start with some foundation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in mathematics, you typically start with some standard axiomatic system. Um, just like also in arithmetic, when you, when you, when you write symbols on a board or, or on a terminal, um, there's an assumption about order of operations. Mm-hmm. It's convention. Um, it's a convention, right? Um, even though um, arithmetic expressions are, by their nature, ambiguous. We disambiguate it because we now have an order of operations that is that is a convention. Absolutely. Doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Nope. It just means if you want to be on the same page. Same thing with mathematics. If you've got the same axioms, then you can arrive at the same... Yeah, but nobody Stick. nobody says you have to take those specific axioms. Um, matter yeah. of fact, uh, the people had, uh, on the web page I was talking about earlier on Facebook, you know, so they're like, "Oh, why don't you get into? Why don't you debate Matt Dillahunty?" And I'm like, "Okay, first of all, you guys don't even know my history about Matt Dillahunty. I'm, <laughs> he, he, Matt Man owes me a huge apology on many different levels. But I'm like, um, the reason Matt Dillahunty blocked me because he got his logic wrong. Um, I was having a discussion on on Facebook on Twitter about multi multi valued logic. And three valued logics, and I was trying to explain. Look, two value two valued logics for bivalent system. Sure, you have the proposition false. Nobody questions that. But there are other logics out there where that may not be suitable to use. I think that's perfectly fine to have a, a, what's called a three value system, where you have a proposition that can be true, false, or unknown value. Okay, and that's perfectly fine to to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just starting with a different axiom. And he was all over that, saying how wrong I was, because he was trying to, to, to work just within the paradigm of classical logic, not trying to understand yeah. that we were not operating in that yes. domain of discourse of classical logic. I do have a super chat I want to get to, uh, but before I do, uh, Adam says uh, that he, get, he gets it, but he says it's a matter of etiquette, not like there's a rule of logic. Well, yeah, there's no rule of logic on that. Same reason why informal fallacies are not informal logic. Informal fallacies are fallacious because of their, not because of their formal logical structure, but there's something about the argument that is fallacious in origin that doesn't make the the, the argument a, a good argument, right? It's, it makes it into a weaker argument because there's an informal fallacy to be had. It doesn't make the conclusion wrong, right? I can have a very bad, bad argument. These are, goes back to that image we had earlier, poorly justified beliefs. I can have a conclusion that's based upon poorly justified beliefs from an informal logical fallacy that does exist, it doesn't mean that that would be the fallacy. Yeah, right? and, and so it's a matter, again, it's a matter of saying with in, the problems with with informal fallacies is they can they can mislead you, right? If you're not careful, even though informal logic and informal fallacies can can be used to to try and argue a point, um, in, in informal fallacies can use be used to deceive someone. Right. The sophistry. They're off, people use them in sophistry quite a bit. Um, April Von Ron for Ten Dollar Canadian. Thank you, April. You're so kind. April, she's she's been very supportive of this channel, and I and I and I cannot. Thank you for the donation, by yeah. the way. Thank you so much. And Josiah Hansen out there, he's a member of the channel, yeah. long supporter of the channel. Um, if you guys want to become a member of the channel, by all means, please. Uh, if you want to be a Patreon, um, the Patreon link is above. Uh, again, I I try to get with my Patreons all the time. If you have a message to me, I will respond. It's almost instantaneously unless I'm out. As people know, I am working now, so I'm not at the computer as much as I once was. If I'm not getting back to you as instantly as I once was, please don't take it personally. Um, I will within 24 hours. Um, but I mean, I've had actually people being like, you know, I messaged you like an hour ago. Where were you? I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> like really okay yeah uh, but she says uh, take care of time zones and the fact that he's sometimes busy and he also has a life and a job and those sort of things as well so yeah, i do get and i do go every so uh i do get out of the house yes uh 
But April says, Landon can be on every day. That would be fine by me. And me, too. Oh, uh, oh thank you, kindly. In fact, um, you know, whenever he's available for Atheological A-Holes, he's going to be the person I want on him or um, or even Andor, I should say. If yeah. we can get you and Ben Watkins from Real oh, Atheology that'd be, on. That would be, be fun. amazing. Yeah, that would be oh, fun in there. So he's, he's do that. I got to tell you, dude, that dude is just wicked smart. Yes. Uh, in fact, he has a formal education. So, um, combination of a perspective, you actually know what you're talking about. And he does something that a lot of other uh, atheist people on the internet or atheist activists don't do. He will actually come up with novel or at least derivative type of, of argumentations. I think there's really no such thing as a completely de novo argument. I mean, mm -hmm. even in mathematics, how, how de novo can you get? But I mean, he will have arguments that are new, that are, you know, in some ways to his generous, as they say. Um, I mean, uh, in a category of themselves. Um, and, and, and that to me is impressive. Like, I think that, that like my atheist semantic collapse argument in some way, I don't know if I'm gonna go so far to say it's too generous, but it's certainly, novel in its approach by using a semiotic square of opposition and i haven't seen that done before and so when i when i formulated that particular argument you know um it was something like okay i want to add to the body of evidence out there um why certain things would be the case a proof i want to i want to add to the to the knowledge of philosophy there's like scientific knowledge exists a lot philosophical knowledge exists so ben adds to that and i respect that to no end because you don't see a lot of atheists going on a limb do that because his arguments might be wrong, but what he does is he tests them. I do. I go to yes. say, here's my argument. Have at it. And I get the shittiest responses. Like, okay, well, you haven't proved your axiom or, or you're using a word wrong. Okay, that's not a way to defeat an argument. But it used to be that people had debates where they would take positions and discuss them, not yelling at them like you see on the, on the TV, but discuss them to explore and at the end synthesize perhaps a, a new, uh, some new understanding, right? So, so, so having debate doesn't mean I'm right, you're wrong, or the vice versa around. It means let's explore the, the points, let's, let's test them, and let's see what comes out, um, and, and let's try arguing from perspectives to, to test the, 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 the thing that you're discussing. Exactly. Um, um, but real quick, Church of Entropy is out there. I have been a guest on his show, so uh, welcome over here, Church, oh, Church of Entropy. Uh, he says, generally, Burner Proof is on the one bringing the unorthodox claim. The term means nothing outside a particular school with a well-defined doctrine, which is the truth maker. Well, no, yes and no. Again, um, terms have usages. And so if you go read like Michael Martin, who was a firm advocate of negative atheism, that Dr. Flew in 1972 and Dr. Smith in 1974, a case against God, had tried to advocate for, um, you'll notice that Dr. Michael Martin actually utilizes, he doesn't say necessarily the phrase burden of proof, but he definitely know, says that the negative atheist has a, a, a responsibility to justify their position. Or non-position. I mean, yeah. it's still, it still is a second-order position. It's sitting on the fence. A lack of belief atheist is a fence sitter. I've been, pro I've proven this logically six ways a Sunday. There's just, yeah. there's no atheist out there, out there has disproved that. But somebody had sent somebody on my Facebook page, and I don't know if you guys follow me on Facebook. Some of you guys, some of you don't, but um, if you guys want, um, just find me on Facebook, and, and I'll, and I'll add mm -hmm. you. But he was, he was telling me that he had, he had ran across somebody who says, look, I merely don't believe God exists. And the guy rightfully pointed out to him, so you're fence sitting. You haven't conclusion yet. He's like, I'm not fence sitting. I'm like, okay, yes, you are. You have a fundamental misunderstanding. You are fence sitting if you merely lack a belief God. This because you're in the same logical position. Agnostic. Um, so when you're talking about burden of proof, um, it's not just the person bringing the claim, right? orthodox or not. I'm not a big fan of ECRI. Extraordinary yeah. claims require extraordinary evidence. I'm not a big fan of that. And the reason being is from a derivative point of view, from a reductionist point of view, all claims require the same, same thing. Just show it, right? Now, yeah. it, it can be very difficult, right? The Ryman hypothesis can be very difficult to probably prove it, right? But, how, but in, if you reduce it to its fundamental thing, how do you show the extraordinary, and I don't know if it's so much of an extraordinary claim, but it's in mathematics, it's a hell of a claim, the, the, the Ryman hypothesis, because it has so many implications. Yeah. But how would you, in theory, do it? You just, you prove it. Same thing by saying, look, I have, yeah. I have a, so from have a mathematical an... point of view, you're, you're, you're right. right. But if someone comes and says, you know, makes a extraordinary claim that, you know, that, that 
uh, aliens are, okay, here, are here's an alien. easily detectable right. in, by, 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 by telescopes. You don't need extraordinary um, evidence. You just need evidence. Here's, evidence, the, here's, right. here's the alien. That's, now, I mean, now, that's it. The thing is, if, if you make something which is, which is surprising, um, it would behoove you to present um, uh, an argument that's credible. Yeah, no, I and agree. what I think the the burden, you know, this burden yeah, well, claims. It, what it is is is, is the deg it's the degree of difficulty in in providing that evidence and that justification. But in theory, sure. it still is. Oh, aliens exist. Here's an alien, right? If God exists, here's God. It really yeah. can be reduced to that degree. Um, now, somebody in the in the live chat had put um, in the Clifford's principle, um, and Clifford's principle is a thing, uh, the principle found in in evidentialism. That it is wrong always, everywhere, and for everyone, anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence, which I deny that principle. I'm not a big fan of Clifford's principle, but that is a moral claim. What Clifford was talking about was the morality of believing something without insufficient reason. If he, if you were to allow, if you, if I believe something, right? If I believe, <clears throat> if Landon went across the street right now, and for whatever reasons, right? Let's say I know there's some heavy traffic. I know that if he crosses the street, he's probably going to get hit by a car, right? And I believe that that's going to happen, but I allow him to do it anyways. And he makes it across the street to the other side safely. Even though that he has made it across the street safely, I have created, I have actually done it. Immoral. Even though I didn't act, even though I didn't do anything, I have, I have an immoral belief because I didn't stop him from, right? But what Clifford was saying that is it's wrong always and um, everywhere for anybody to believe anything with this evidence. Because I shouldn't have allowed, I shouldn't have believed he would he would cross the street safely. I had insufficient evidence that he would believe that the, that he would cross the street safely. Yeah. This yeah. actually and this actually happened to Clifford. He actually was on a ship that that um, would sink, and so he, he he created this particular principle to say, look, um, if you, if you allow a ship to sail believing that's unseaworthy and it doesn't it doesn't sink, um, is it immoral, right? Now, there's a lot of problems with that, evidentially speaking, and even as far as like the ontics of what your moral obligation is. But most people I know don't really follow strict evidentialism or more of a moderate or weak form of it, which I do as well. But yeah. that's what Clifford's talking about there, Chemo. It's you're talking about um, an ethics, which is completely you know, relevant to this particular episode. But it, it is interesting to note that that is not even an epistemological principle so much as an ethical principle. Um, what else we got here? Anything else in, in looking around the, the chat? There's a lot, a lot of interesting discussion in the chat, by the way. It's in Yeah, no, I love it. Um, Church of Entry says, how would you explain something to someone they have no way to relate to? Um, I would do it basically um, heuristically. I would do it in a way that may not be exactly the, the correct way, but close enough where they can understand it. Uh, heuristic, yeah. Nothing wrong with heuristic approaches as long as people know that it is. And we see this all the time. Uh, when somebody may not have the skill set to know the technical details of it, but you're going to explain it to them in a very basic way. For example, when I first learned about the atom, we I learned about the Bohr model, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we all know that the Bohr model is crap. <laughs> the Bohr model yeah. doesn't exist, right? There's, you don't have these these electrons spinning around a nucleus that we, you know you grew up learning in school. It was heuristic. We understand now because of quantum mechanics, these things are basically a cloud. And there's a cloud of probability that exists around the nucleus of where yeah. an electron may be, but you could yeah. actually argue that the electron doesn't even exist in that cloud until it's observed <laughs> to pinpoint the location yeah. to some degree. Obviously you're gonna have, um, you can't know exactly yeah. where it is because again, Heisenberg's a certainty principle. And, and even more so, that it's not it's not certain what the size electron is. You know, there are models that say electrons are point, a point charge. And there, but but we don't know that. So there are experiments going on to try to 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 produce a, a an upper bound on the potential size of the electron. So it, it gets even right. more. And if it's there. a point but, source, but, then, you, then you start getting the string theory. Yeah. So 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 some of the things in particular is is about how it matter is if you talk about trying to explain something. Um, it it behooves you to try to come up with a way to explain something simply. I mean, that's one of the things that that Feynman you know drilled in. Was 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 that um, you need if to truly understand something, you need to be able to explain it to someone of of moderate intelligence, right? Without using all the language he said, the language of the priesthood, right? So the reason why he spent time teaching me about special relativity and general relativity is he wanted to be sure his 
understanding and knowledge was that good, right? And so he was able to explain to, to a kid stuff. Now, now when Feynman explained relativity, it, it, it seemed obvious. <laughs> it seemed like, well, well, what's the big deal? It, this, is, this seems rational, this seems logical, right? And, and that was because Feynman really, really understood relativity. Well, I was able to explain it in, in very, very um, moderate, modest terms. What was it you told Feynman you disagreed with and he basically said, okay, oh. Oh well, and, and go go well, go prove it yourself, and you realize you're because, wrong. Because you know, he, having having grounded me in special relativity and general relativity, right? Um, and and yeah, we and it wasn't just hand waving. He actually would do equations. He would give me problems to work on, and and some of the problems were trivial, and he expected me to come back the next day with the answer. Some of the problems were difficult. He expected me to to make progress on the things, and some problems were unknown. The, the, the solution was unknown, and and he expected me to explain why they're difficult, right? So he wouldn't tell me whether a, a problem was trivial, hard, or or unsolved yet, right? And and that was kind of his, his part part of his 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 method of, of teaching. But again, if you were able to explain something on relativity to someone and and not get it wrong, right? You, you could explain something by saying relativity is 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 magic carpets, right? No, don't do that. But if but if you can explain the principles and the fundamentals so they can get a solid understanding that's that that's proper, um, you really understand the subject. You, the teacher, understand the subject. So so um, but um, he went on uh, a bit later then to sort of try to explain quantum um, uh, quantum chromodynamics. And he started off by explaining quantum mechanics. And he started explaining the quest the quantum mechanics to be and <laughs> I Okay, I understand. I was like, I was a kid. I was, I was a, I was a teenager, right? And, and as a Feynman, so you started explaining quantum mechanics, and and I had, I had loved the, the relativity stuff. I mean, the the, the the Einstein stuff makes sense. Again, when when Feynman explains it, 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 it really comes across as like, well, of course, this is the way it is. Um, but when he started explaining about some of the stuff that quantum mechanics was doing, I said, well, now you're just being silly. <laughs> Two. To Feynman and 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 his he laughed. Things, don't age, like, things that don't age well. <laughs> and, and of course, of course, Steve laughed. He, Feynman laughed, and he's and but he said, you know, I said uh, you're and and so he said, why, why do you think I'm I'm being silly? And so I gave him, based on for relativity, well, blah 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 blah. Right? I actually it actually that's where he he went from just being I, I wasn't an insult, but he was actually. Pleased because he said yes. From relativity point of view, this is a problem. And I said, and I and I went further. In fact, I went, I I I started diving into some of the extreme spots, some of the extreme relativity relativistic situations. Say, but but quantum mechanics and blah blah blah, and relativity would be, you know, if that's the truth, then this would happen, right? And and he said, yes, that's that that is that you're 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 on the right track. So so he wasn't insulted. He was actually quite pleased. That I got early on that quantum mechanics and and relativity weren't playing nice with each other, and so he set off to say, oh, well, "You were thinking, you were conceptualizing, you were understanding that there were some issues there." Matter of fact, you know, um, you know those 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 you have um, they explain five different levels of difference. They do yeah. it as a like a, yeah. a thought, five year old, uh, a junior uh -huh. high, a high school, a graduate student, C level, mm -hmm. right? Um, can you, I I I want I, I want to try something like that, maybe on something like the lines of uh, point. Because I just yeah. had this happen the other day, and by the way, I couldn't do the pH level because that would require, I think, a level like like supraniums, which I don't know how to. Work. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with supraniums. I could do pH level D level, but I could do the under one. I could do calculus level of of, of that mathematics. Okay, I think you, you would mm -hmm. agree that I could probably come up with that. And I have yeah. mathematical proofs. I know yeah. Gar Garber yeah. have um, has a proof on it, and it's it's a pretty straightforward proof using um uh, uh what does he use um. Bounded conditions as far as, uh, yeah. uh, oh, what was it? Uh, uh, but anyways, there's limited sequences, right? Kochi sequences. I didn't think of the term. Yes. He was using Kochi. Um, and, and we know that Kochi or Didi Kikai cuts could be used to prove that. So I, I could handle that. But I had this happen the other day where a friend of mine, um, he didn't quite get that point nine I repeat. You know? And so he, he was like, can you explain to me in a very simple Which I did. Didn't require, as you said, the, the 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 terminology of the of the, the language of the priesthood, language of the priesthood, language of the priesthood. Right. Language of the priesthood. It didn't require that, right? I didn't have to get into calculus. And he was like, huh. 
And and so that's the thing that Feynman well, would find. He would he would seek out and find people to explain stuff to, for the purpose of Feynman understanding it better, to test his understanding again by by not trying to use not trying to use terms in the system. So some of the things that that you get some really bad arguments or bad teaching because you use terms to define the, themselves and you use itself to to justify itself. That's a, that's a you can because he said. You know, what I would say is that we have an extraordinary ability to fool ourselves. So just because it seems okay doesn't mean it's actually okay. So so not only was I in, in going in college um, testing quantum mechanics to see if I could catch it in there, and I failed. I also was doing a lot of stuff with relativity. One of my common experiments I would do in college would be the major speed of light and major round trip and major other relativistic effects. That was kind of a, the thing because I was. I didn't say, well, Feynman said, therefore, it was true. Right. I did not say that that uh, that Einstein said, therefore, it's true. And you learned from your failure. Yes. I I went and, and tested, and he said, you're right. What you should do, so you see this conflict, is go out and test them. Well, that's the same thing, like, point I'm repeating. Like, I keep telling people, look, if you think it's wrong, prove it. Prove it, Show, yes. show it to me. Never yeah. happened, now, right? Now, but... on, you know, on that level, the five levels, when I would get to the expert level, I would be, I would, you'd have a discussion about things um, such as Cantor sets and and cannibal infinities and um, other things relating to to Carnality, infinite, right? Cardinalities, yeah, yeah, and that and sort I, of thing. And, and I, I would be hard. I, I I would be able to sit in that conversation. No, I'm not that level. Yeah, but that sort of thing. But but still, you don't need that. Uh, I find on those five levels when you get to the get to the expert level. Um, you're actually going beyond the initial point and in, in talking about the, the, the field of stuff. I'm, I'd probably be overthinking it because, again, using coaching secrets would be suffi sufficient enough to do a proof yeah. to show that it's equal. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I would start off with just basic algebra. You know, one third equals 0.33, one third plus yeah. one third plus one third, 0.33 plus. Yeah. You know, and that would be a very simplistic way. And then build upon that and go to work like maybe geographic, ge ge geometric progression, which is very simple. And the, then I would use um, perhaps probably. Uh, a yeah. limit, limit of a sequence or uh, just serious, yeah. a serious. And know, for, for a kid, a I would just, I would just do a cycle of the, the, the Zeno zero, right? And yeah, say, Zeno's arrow gets, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as it is paradox with on the, because the arrow get there. And, and one half, like, one, one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one eighth is going to equal one. And you show the kid that, that, that it eventually gets there and say, well, blah, 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 you know, and, and you go through his thing and said, you, you, you could show that those at those levels. But again, he was so so Feynman would seek out people that he could explain stuff to to test and improve his knowledge about stuff. And 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 so what whatever convinced him at, the, at that, you know, in the 1970s, he needed to go in Bona, you know, go go and do a refresher on relativity. I'm not sure. But but he found a willing subject, and so he spent you know spent number of days drilling this into me, and and that's that the thing that's awesome. the brilliant about Feynman. Um, I would say go you find online some of the Feynman's lectures he gives on YouTube to go on YouTube and, and watch some of his lectures or or the Feynman famous Feynman's lectures he would do. Right? Um, again, you know a Nobel Prize winning physicist of extraordinary uh, capability um, who could. Who could come up with symbols like Feynman diagrams to convey really complex subatomic things in a very simple way, right? That was that was. Well, he, even, he even created his own symbology for um, uh, trigonometric trigonometric function. Yes, and I think his symbology yeah. is cool. I, I don't know yes. if it has much usage, but it it makes sense. It's and, and so nomenclature would make sense. And it's an expectation of QED, um, quantum electrodynamics, is, is really good. In fact, there's a book, there's a very, very thin book uh, by Feynman called QED, right? And, 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 and it doesn't contain heavy equations. It doesn't contain really wacky stuff. It has a, a plausible explanation for, for uh, quantum mechanics and and. I love, I, love, I love that. Stuff. And, and it's, it's a very thin book, right? Quantum um, electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics. Oh my God. That, that, that I think is cut. You know, I think that, that science, when it really does make those models um, verified, confer, you know, confirmed what, what we think we understand about quantum uh, chromodynamics, I think it's going to be revolutionary. Wow. I, I, and I think that uh, Feynman was way ahead of his time. And so, so here's a book, you know, QED, 
the strange theory of light and matter. And and it's it's on University Press. You can find it almost shown on, on, online. It's a brilliant book, and it doesn't it doesn't contain you know big formulas. It contains diagrams and and simple terms. Just right? how I like it. No math. And and, <laughs> and, and, and and it is it is a brilliant description of QED that um, I'm a visual person like give, that. I I I would love to read that. I mean, in fact, I I'll tell you, Landon, and I know we got to wrap this up. Um, um, I've always kind of knew kind of what, you know, like, you know, I understood the basic principles of a four-year trans. Mm -hmm. That's something you have to learn in mathematics, but you don't really, mm -hmm. I really never even understood remotely anything about it until I watched a video on it on YouTube. Later. There's a, you're out there, you're yeah. the three black, blue, blue. Yeah. Blue, or, yeah. Oh, yes. Brown, blue. He made a video on the four-year transformation that was so intuitive and having to do with the frequency windings that it was like, holy crap, where was this 30 years ago? You know, when, when I had to learn about um, electromagnetism and angular mm -hmm. frequencies mm -hmm. and I had to do the mathematics, which I no longer can ever forget if mm -hmm. I had to, but it was so visualized. So it was like, oh, this is, of course, going to the time domain. This is what they mean by this. This is actually what's happening. Um, and that's what I really, that's how I learned. I, I learned much better visually like that. And it's so weird that we have more information more knowledge to kind of wrap it up more scientific knowledge now than we ever have in the history of humanity at our fingertips sure and yet you still and have people out there that do not go out of their way to learn any of it and then worse they deny it yeah and it's a sad sad thing but but I say yeah yeah so my my book course is signed by by yeah. Simon. but you can get yours it's a really thin book like a lot of the stuff is is, is just it, it doesn't. It is not theory. It's got you know almost every page has pictures and diagrams. I love and so that. Forth. Yes, I love and that. and it is a brilliant discussion and presentation by Feynman. This is sort of his, 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 his at his at his his best when he can explain really difficult. QED is really difficult, but the way he explains it, it just seems. You better not ever eBay that, okay? Yeah. So so <laughs> so I would find go out and find this book. And and read it doesn't it, it, it you could take do it in the afternoon, um, it's not very long but you get you'll get all the slit experiment stuff and all the things there so so I, I would prove that he didn't completely disown me when I said now you're being silly <laughs> he, he, he and, and 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 of course you know I I I I have come to believe quantum mechanics because the the theory has ample abstract evidence so which i have done myself right so there all we right go. well we are we are well <laughs> over you. a two hour mark um so guys i really want to thank you for joining us this episode uh, i do have another stream that i'm gonna be doing again on that one video that i kind of watched and, and the burden of proof i'm gonna i'm probably gonna do a review <laughs> on it because the guy is just he's an english i guess he's an english major uh he thinks i'm the arrogant one and i'm and i'm and, <laughs> and it's so funny because i'm like look you think i'm doing penetry you think that i am I'm being arrogant because I'm explaining how things are commonly understood in a domain of discourse. Yet you have not shown what I've said to be correct. But there, the argument is basically, well, lay people use it this way. Okay, fine. But that raises the question, is there reasons why lay people should use terminology in that particular way and then say, oh, I have my videos about philosophy. If I was a creationist and I started using terminology like theory means yes or evolution means change, but my video is biologically based, I would be misleading people. Yeah, and so that's yeah. my argument to to him. And it's, when he's going through the, his, his his video and he's talking about the burden of proof, he has a lot of conceptual errors. I think about it, right, and so you can't say that my your video is philosophically based and then butcher, you know, these concepts, <laughs> or, or at worst, just parrot what you think you've heard. Oh, well, all these other atheists say this, therefore must be the case. Well, why? Why don't you challenge the paradigm? Why don't you challenge the establishment? I mean, the most confident people out there when they go against the theists are the ones that will say, look, God doesn't exist. Let me tell you why. And it's not that hard to justify that. Yeah. Now, I don't particularly hold that position. Uh, Landon particularly doesn't hold that position. Uh, no. But we're well established in our belief system of why we hold what we do hold. And I think that it's, it's, it's all how you want to formulate your, your worldview. Sure. No one size fits all. Um, the people that are out there Explain it to, to people, you know, why God doesn't exist as opposed to why God does exist. You know, they have their own worldviews on it. And I think what Landon and I do is basically just explain 
This is how it would appear to a theist. This is how it appears to an atheist. This is how these are, these are terms are used in mathematics. These are how a science, if you read a science paper, this is how it would be interpreted. And that's how I think you and I basically kind of do. And yet I get so much shit for it and nobody, gives you, <laughs> nobody, nobody says anything to you. Well, because it. it's, it's, that, that, it's not that, fair. That, that, three, blue that, one, three Blue One Brown, that's what it was. Yeah. Three Blue One Brown, but, great channel. But, but I, so, so I were to thank the folks in the chat for, for sticking with Aren't this they program. Awesome? And, and you had some really insightful comments on there. Um, things we've gotten wrong, um, show us we're wrong, we're happy to be corrected. I apologize if, if I made some misstatements in there, but but we did our best and you did your best by, by sticking with it. Those that join late, you can go and review this because I assume you'll be upload this um, later on. And we'd be happy to, uh, if you had, I don't, if you had, if they have people have follow on questions, uh, maybe they can, they can post comments yeah, on your video yeah, and, and, and Steve can alert me to. I, w I wish I could make my mods do it. Um, only one really does, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, leave but, a comment. I love the comments. Comments are everything. Um, but again, if you guys want to become a patron on the channel, I'm going to, uh, my next stream though, I know for a fact that's scheduled. Guess who's coming on on the 14th? Who's coming on the 14th? Who's the, who's the greatest flat earth debunker on the, in, in the history? And the ugliest. Reds? Yes, I was gonna say and the, and the ugliest <laughs> and the ugliest person alive. That should be yeah, a big um, He's he's fantastic on debunking. Um, he doesn't quite know his uh, mobile device operating systems, but we all <laughs> we all have our burdens. But what is getting? What, oh, we're gonna have to talk about that. Uh, Android versus. That's interesting. No, um, it's, it's a. I, I know. I'm 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 teasing him. He that's one of his. That's one of his. Um, I can tell you right now. He he. I I know this for. Reds. He's, he doesn't. He has. He doesn't have a Steam account. I'm sorry. How how does somebody not have a Steam account? Uh, he's not a gamer. That's why. But I still was like, I, really? I, Come on. And, and to some Steam extent, account. Steam is 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 a, is a is a good platform because it, you're not tied to a particular stuff. It, it gives you almost a hardware independent way of, of playing yes. games, which I think is is more equitable. Yeah, no, I, I um, like I like Steam. And, and and but the problem, of course, is the gaming game development industry is is a um, they have some interesting ethical uh, situations. And yeah. I, I'm not talking about Gamergate. I'm talking about how the businesses run. No, no, I, I, Epic has some problems with. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, but anyway, but, uh, guys, yeah. Thank you again for 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 uh, having me on, and thanks again, chat room for. Uh, Putting up with us. I'll leave them with this. Uh, maybe they can solve my problem because I can't figure out a solution. I don't know if there is one because the code is different. But on Epic Games, XCOM 2 was free. And yes, I have some mods for it that I've, I've found. But I wanted to play the Long War. Long War seems to be a If you know a way around that, that actually works. And, and, don't, and don't tell me about the 2K loader. And you know, I'll try to all that. If you know a way that actually works that you have verified to get... The Long War working with XCOM 2, which is a fantastic freaking game. Let me know. I would appreciate it. Okay? <laughs> but guys, right. guys, good night. And I'll see you on Non Sequitur Show on the 14th of Saturday uh, at 3 o'clock. Hey, no, at 4 o'clock. Hey, give, give Fritz my, my best, 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 best regards. I do I appreciate his flat earth debunking, as I think it's important. Absolutely. Let him know that. All right, guys. Looking forward to reading your comments and any new Patreons. I appreciate it. Have a good day. And, I pre and the existent ones and the existent members and your mods. Good night. Good night.